Hi there, everyone. I'm Joe Newberg, president of the Geological Society of Minnesota. Welcome to our sixth GSM lecture for the fall 2021 season. Thanks for being part of a tradition that goes back 83 years to 1938. This lecture's dual topic is a brief overview of Black Hills geology by Mark Fehrenbach, PhD, and Gold in the Black Hills by Brian Fagnan. More about these two gentlemen later. Tonight's format will be these announcements, then Mark and Brian's one hour lecture, followed by Q&A. All participants other than the hosts, the presenter, and the moderators are muted. For most lectures, including this one, Randy Strobel is the host, and he, Dave Wilhelm, and I are moderators. As always, thanks, Randy, for setting up these Zoom webinars. The Zoom platform offers a number of means for interaction that we use. We'd like to handle most questions at the end. To enter a question anytime during the lecture, click the Q&A icon and type in your question. You need not wait until the end. Please specify which speaker the question is addressed to. For those few persons joining by phone, we will unmute you at the end in case you have any questions. We might also unmute other questioners if they need to clarify their question. If you have a quick question for which you would like an immediate answer, click the raise hand icon and enter the question. For these, the moderators will use their judgment about interrupting the presenter during their presentation. Also use raise hand to report any technical issue you might experience. There's also a chat option that allows you to type a message for all participants to see. Feel free to use that before the lecture starts to greet others. <laughs> um, be sure to use the all panelists and attendees option. I'll mention three other ways we use chat shortly. Like most GSM webinars, this one will be recorded. The full lecture schedule is on our website, gsmn.org. Thanks to Steve Erickson for arranging another outstanding slate of topics and presenters. As with our live lectures, this lecture is free and open to the public, not just GSM members. If you're not a GSM member, please open the chat box and type non-member in your city and state, province, or country. Also mention how you found out about us. We like to see how many non-members attend so we can see how well our information reaches the general public. So please do that for us. Thank you. And of course, we'd love for you to consider joining our organization. Membership information and forms are on our website. Membership dues are the primary method by which we fund these lectures and our other programs. Also, we can count the number of devices that tune in, but not the number of people who watch from each. So we can get a better count of those participating. If you are watching us with at least one other person, type two persons or whatever your number is in the chat box. Thank you. Continuing education credits. These lectures are eligible for one hour of CE credits. If that's something you can use, Use chat to request a form. Include your name and email address. If you don't want everyone to see this information, there is a chat option that allows only the moderators to see what you type. Following the meeting, we'll fill out a form, sign it, and email it to you. Are there any other announcements? Raise hand if so. Okay. Our first speaker, Mark Fehrenbach, received a Bachelor's of Science degree in geology from Michigan State University, East Lansing, Michigan. He's got a little Go Spartans uh, <laughs> bit in here. And then a doctorate in geology from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, Rapid City, South Dakota. He has worked for the South Dakota Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources geological survey program for over 25 years, mainly performing geologic mapping of the Black Hills. And our second speaker, Brian Fagnan, 
is a cert certified professional geologist who has worked for the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources Geological Survey Program for the last 20 years. He holds a master's degree in geology, geological engineering from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology and a bachelor's degree in geology and audio communications from the State University of New York College at Fredonia. Well, with those introductions, uh, I'll welcome Mark and turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Can you all see the, the screen? Hello? No, 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 we don't. No. You have to do a start sharing. I, uh, I did. Yeah, I'll help you. It's How about, oh, you got it. There we go. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, my name is Mark Fehrenbach, and I'm with the South Dakota Geological Survey Program of the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And um, the title is A Brief Overview of Black Hills Geology. Well, I'm going to try to keep it brief, but we do have about two and a half billion years of, of geologic history we need to get through here. And so we'll try and go a little quicker. Um, let's see here, why aren't we going forward? There we go. So the structural setting for the Black Hills, um, we're kind of in a unique area. It's on what's called the Trans-Hudson origin. And it's a plane of weakness that developed between the um, Wyoming, Superior and Central Plains um, provinces. And the Black Hills were exposed from the Laramide uplift of the Rocky Mountains about 65 million years ago. And actually, the Black Hills are the farthest eastern extent of the Black Hills uplift. And it extends north in the subsurface into the Miles City Arch of Montana and south in the subsurface of the Shattern Arch of Nebraska. And it also includes the Bear Lodge Mountains of Wyoming. And again, it contains rocks from about 2.5 billion years ago to the recent. And the Black Hills have been classically referred to as a dome. Well, we'll take a look at that in a minute. Um, but really, it's, it's a crescentic, asymmetric, double plunging anticline. And we'll, whoops, we'll take a look here. Um, this shows the, um, the position. We've got the state outlines and this area with all the little crinkles, that's the Trans-Hudson origin. You can see the Black Hills would be right around in here. And again, we're sandwiched between these um, essentially cratonic plates at, that started to move apart about two and a half billion years ago. It was essentially like a failed triple junction. And so sedimentation started and we had source areas from the east, source areas from the west. And it started out as essentially um, um, terrestrial defluvial in the Box Elder Creek um, quartzite, one of the um, older Precambrian units. And as you went up just a little bit, it started to get alluvial fans that were migrating out to near, near shore. And then eventually most of the Precambrian, then after that is um, marine in this deep basin of the Trans-Hudson origin. There's a um, geologic map of the Central Hills. And again, I mentioned that crescentric um, asymmetric doubly plunging anticline. You can see that it, it's curved. It is a crescent shape. It's not round. A dome is essentially round by definition and equal dips on either side of it. Well, this thing dips about 20 to 30, about 10 to 20 degrees on the eastern side and 60 to 70 degrees on the western side as you go into Wyoming. So there's the asymmetric. And again, it plunges to the north in the Mile City Arch, plunges to the south into the Shadron Arch. So again, we have this crescentric, asymmetric with the um, uneven dips, doubly plunging anticline because it is warped up. It's not warped down. We don't have a synclinal fold here. There is a, a little diagram for a cross section. Again, it shows the central core. Um, the, the more gentle dips on the east side. And as you go in, over into Wyoming, we're missing a little bit here of Wyoming. That would go, again, the dips are about 60 to 70 degrees. So quite steep on the Wyoming side. 
uh, types of rocks in the Black Hills, we have the, your, uh, the sedimentary, your clastic, mainly sandstone, shales, conglomerates, chemical um, sediments like limestone and evaporate, evaporites, gypsum, and hydrate, both intrusive and extrusive igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks in the um, center of the Black Hills. And those have been um, acted upon by heat, pressure, fluids, and it's changed their chemistry, it's changed their mineralogy. And all three of these rock types do occur in the Black Hills. Here is a, strat I know this is very busy, um, but stratigraphic section, which essentially shows the layers of the rock units, oldest at the bottom, going youngest at the top. On the left side, it shows the ages. Uh, there's the rock names. And then the, um, the little cartoon, all the patterns there show there's dolomitic limestone, there's a siltstone, shales, concretions. That shows kind of uh, generalized rock types, thicknesses, then a brief description of the rock units. So these are very, uh, uh, strat column, no matter where you go and you want to look at rocks, they're very handy to know what rock units occur there and what is their, their ages and their stratigraphic or their age successions. So we'll start with the Precambrian, again, from about 2.5 billion to 1.715 billion years ago. Uh, they're metamorphosed sedimentary and igneous rocks, and they've undergone at least three deformational events, probably four. And they, they're mainly, whoops, mainly at the um, green schist metamorphose, um, metamorphic facies, which kind of lower grade. You can still see the primary bedding, primary structures. They haven't been completely obliter obliterated due to the metamorphism. But we do have various metamorphic grades. Biotite is very low, um, and kyanite is a fairly high temperature uh, metamorphic grade. And you get that highest one due to the Harney Peak granite of the batholith that was intruded. And that was the last Precambrian unit that we had happen in the Black Hills. And these Precambrian rocks, they do host many economic mineral resources. Here's a picture of the Orville formation in the Southern Hills. And these flat surfaces, that's foliation. And as the rocks got crunched, all the, the micas, the flat minerals lined up with each other and essentially formed, you know how mica, you can peel that apart in layers. And so these micas lined up and you can essentially peel the schist apart in layers. And that's why it's breaking like that. Those um, aligned micas produce these planes of weakness. And the actual bedding, you can see little fine streaks on some of these areas here, the, the actual beds are dipping into the hill and that foliation surface is actually cutting across the bedding at an angle. These, this big vertical wall, these are actually beds of the um, Buck Mountain Quartzite. And re, you have to remember all these um, sediments were laid down horizontally. And as they were um, folded, metamorphosed, they eventually got up, you know, upturned. And some of them were so steeply upturned that now what was on top has actually been flipped over and the top is on the bottom. Um, again, here's a nice succession of Meta gray wacky beds, essentially dirty sandstone, a muddy sandstone. And these more massive beds are more quartz, so it's more quartz grains, and the thinner beds are more shaly. And so, in that deep basin along the side, sediments were dumping down into this basin. And as they'd flood out into the basin, the uh, more sandy, quartz, roast, quartz rich rocks would get deposited first, and then the shales would go out and be deposited last. And so we have the sequence of, of um, more quartzose units and shales, quartzose shales, as these um, sediments build up and then dump down into the basin. Um, I mentioned some of the folding. Um, here is an isoclinal recumbent fold, isoclinal that it's the act fold axes are even. They're pair of their, um, yeah, they're both the same, essentially recumbent. This fold is on its side. If you can see the fold, it's in a nice road cut right there. And it looks like a, a V on its side. Um, here's one of the metamorphosed um, intrusive rocks. This is a, a basalt. And again, basalt's usually though an extrusive, but this was 
blurped out on the bottom of this basin, kind of like along the um, mid um, oceanic rift where the basalts are being welled up along the spreading centers. And this was same, it was an undersea um, basalt flow. Um, as you go to the Northern Hills in the Precameron Rocks off to the right here, this is the open cut of the Homestake mine. And Brian will be talking about the mining. So I'm gonna to just touch just very briefly on a couple things here. That's the um, Allison formation on the right. But again, it's cut by these very late um, rhyolite dikes and they're following the foliation. And that's what we saw on that first slide, that nice flat surface. And right there essentially is the Homestake formation, which is what they are mining. And off to the left here is the poor man, which again was barren. There wasn't anything in that to mine. This is a small little bit of the Homestake Formation. Again, very folded. And that was a, essentially a hot spring deposit that was deposited, oh, about 1.92 billion years ago. And these, uh, the folded quartzose layers, those are metachuric, or essentially a silica gel that's often associated with these hot spring deposits. And yes, they did produce gold at Homestake. They produced about 40 million ounces and actually I got to hold this specimen. There's a little bit of gold in that one there. And moving up now, one of the, la the last Precambrian rocks in the Black Hills, the youngest is the Harney Peak granite. And this is a view of Harney Peak, which was renamed um, Black Elk Peak uh, a couple of years ago. And again, that's the highest peak in the Black Hills. And again, 1.715 billion years old. And that was, again, the last Precambrian um, event that happened in the Black Hills was the intrusion of the um, Harney Peak Batholith. It covers about at least 10 square kilometers, actually about, about 30 square kilometers. It's very large, but then there's a lot of satellite um, granitic bodies that come off of that. So it's not one mass. One of the most famous things that's developed in the um, Harney Peak granite is Mount Rushmore. And Gutz and Borglum picked uh, Mount Rushmore. It used to be known as Grandfather Mountain or Cougar Mountain because it had a nice Southern exposure and it had a big expanse, which is what he, he wanted to put the four presidents up there. But he did have problems with some of the rock. You can see there's fractures in there. He had a fracture. That's why um, Roosevelt is kind of tucked back in the corner there. He had to blast Roosevelt off and redo the face. He had to reposition um, Jefferson and also repositioned Washington as the um, carving was progressing. So he had to modify and adapt his, his techniques and where he wanted to put the, um, the faces and the, uh, the, the placement and everything to work around these fractures. Um, the Harney Peak um, granite also produced a lot of lithium and beryllium mineralization. This is the Dan Patch mine. You can see that schist, the wall rock, and there's the granite, the light color. And this little cave, essentially, that's where they were going in and high grading beryllium or barrel crystals. There is a microcline crystal. That thing's over two feet across. And some of the crystals that did develop in the Harney Peak granite, like books of mica, six, eight feet across, barrel crystals of 30 tons, columbite, columbite crystals, and niobium tantalite mineral, eight to 10 tons, just some huge things. Um, the spodumene crystal, there was one discovered at the Eta mine in Keystone, it was 40 feet long. The Russians say they had one that was 42 feet long, but you know, disinformation, I don't know. But anyway, there were, were just some massive um, mineral crystals that were discovered when they were mining these out. And I mentioned that the hills were uplifted during the Laramide or the Cretaceous um, uh, mountain building event. Well, those, when that happened, it did affect some of the Precambrian rocks, not much, but also then the um, Paleozoic and um, rocks that were overlying the Precambrian. And right here, this happens to be a Laramide fault. It's a high angle, normal fault. This is the um, Precambrian um, Ellison formation that's been brought up against the um, Deadwood formation, which is about oh, 550 million years old. So a little bit of an age difference there, but, the um, Precambrian was moving around a little bit when things were being uplifted um, in the late Cretaceous. Yeah, in the late Cretaceous. 
We'll get to the Phanerozoics now, which essentially Phanerozoic rocks, which go from Cambrian to the recent. But in the break between the Precambrian to these younger rocks, there's about one billion years worth of time missing. And we have for the Phanerozoic, both sedimentary and intrusive rocks, and all of these do host economic mineral deposits. Here's a picture of the Great Unconformity. That's the Deadwood Formation, 550 million years old. And you can see the nice, almost horizontal layering in it. And it has an irregular contact with the um, Box Elder Creek Quartzite underneath. And that's almost vertical. And again, along that surface, there's about a billion years worth of time that's not represented. So we either had non-deposition or erosion but they're thinking that th that un unconformity was possibly related to a global glaciation event. And this shows um, how, where the um, Precambrian be was being weathered when the Cambrian rocks were being deposited. The Cambrian um, sea and the environment was essentially semi-tropical. So you had this essentially semi-tropical to tropical weathering on this iron rich Precambrian unit, but the iron has essentially been leached out and just dissolved away almost forming like a tropical soil later right. We'll move into the Deadwood Formation here. And I know this is a lot to look at, but um, that was named by Nathaniel Horatio Darton. And he was the main, one of the main geologists that worked out in the Black Hills from the late 1880s up until the 1920s. But he is credited with mapping over 1 million square miles in the Western United States. He also worked in Maryland and Pennsylvania and out on the, uh, the East Coast. This guy was a dynamo. I mean, it wasn't just him. He had a whole team of geologists working with him, but he was, again, instrumental in doing a lot of the early geologic mapping of the Western US. And a lot of these maps, the areas haven't been maps, mapped since then. And so those maps are still good. So with the, the um, Deadwood Formation that thickens to the north into the Powder River Basin and the sea that deposited this came from the west. And so if you go out to the west, the sea gets older into the middle Cambrian, Wyoming. By the time you get to the west coast, you're into the um, lower Cambrian. And again, the Deadwood does host some economic um, uh, mineral deposits around the hills. So when, if you get up to um, Deadwood to try your luck at some of the um, gambling up there and get some good food, uh, right there in town, that's the type section of the Deadwood Formation. And again, this big massive exposure of sandstone, it's about 400 feet thick up in the, um, up there at Deadwood and it thickens to the north. There is a view in Spearfish Canyon, you can see the thin bedding in there. And again, these are all sandstone layers. Here's a close-up of a what's called an intraformational conglomerate. And back during the Cambrian, they did have storms. You can see there's essentially a horizontal layer at the bottom. Then you have this conglomerate layer and then a horizontal layer at the top. So a storm came through, churned up the bottom, ripped up things, a semi-lithified bottom essentially. And as the storm passed, all things got deposited back down, but now it's all ripped up and chaotic. And as the quiet conditions return, then we get horizontal sediments deposited on top. And you'll get this, um, this sequence repeating in several areas. You'll get the horizontal layering storm event, horizontal layering, another storm event. So it's kind of neat to see how the environment was changing and, and the rocks, how they recorded it. This is a, a aerial view of the Gilt Edge mine, and a lot of the mineralization at this mine is inactive now, but that was in the Deadwood Formation. A lot of um, low-grade gold replacement deposits, maybe a few hundredths of an ounce per ton, but it's there. It's gold, and they were making, making money on it. The Winnipeg, Winnipeg Formation overlies the um, Deadwood, again, named by Darton. Um, it's Ordovician in age, Upper Ordovician. And it thins to the um, to the south, so it mainly occurs just in the northern hills, and it's equivalent to um, the Winnipeg Formation in Canada, the Decorah Shale in Minnesota, out with by you guys, Harding Sandstone and in, in um, Powder River Basin and down of uh, Wyoming and down into Colorado, and it was later split out into the Icebox Shale member, which is at the bottom, a green shale, 
and um, the rough lock siltstone near the top. And it's, it's not very well exposed. And where it is exposed, it typically, if you have a wet spring or something, it forms mud slopes, mud slides on steep slopes. There's the um, icebox shale. It's a sort of a glauconitic green shale, which does have small little um, plates of a strachoderm, um, essentially jaw, primitive jawless fish. Uh, this is near the top of the uh, formation, and this is the rough lock siltstone. So we're getting silt and quartz grains, much lighter colored in there. And essentially we're grading up into the overlying unit, the whitewood limestone. There is a um, reconstruction of one of the um, strachoderms, the jawless fish. And what you do find in there are little bits of this, this head shield. And that was the bony part on the fish. The rest was essentially skin, flesh. And so this was the hard part. And this was all made up of thousands of little plates stuck together. And that's what you can find are some of these little plates occasionally. Interesting fish. The whitewood limestone, again, Ordovician and it's restricted to the Northern Hills. Um, it's equivalent to the, um, essentially the bighorn dolomite in Wyoming. Um, age is based on orthocone cephalopods. And as you go into um, the white or the um, um, Powder River Bay, or excuse me, the um, Williston Basin in the North, it does go into the Red River Formation, which actually does have um, gas producing wells here in South Dakota. Uh, it also contains a large gastropod, essentially six inches in diameter, called Macleorides. Um, there's a, a view of it at the type section, and it's um, this part right here. It looks like a wall. It's very thick bedded, kind of nondescript um, dolomitic limestone. That's a view of one of the exposed bedding surfaces, and all these traces, those are fossil burrows on there. So that that bottom sea bottom was probably just alive with things crawling along there feeding on the organics in the mud leaving their traces and there's quite a few different types here uh, mainly neurites and planolites it's hard to see you know tell there's just again a myriad of different types on just that one bedding surface several of the um, waterfalls in the northern hills maybe the little spearfish falls here and then rough lock falls um, it's the um, whitewood limestone that is making the falls. That's their resistant rock unit that they're falling over, that they're you know flowing over. There is an orthocone cephalopod, Orthoceras, and that was one of the things that they used to date the age of the um, whitewood. And there is a fossil of it, and you can see it's divided up into these chambers, and those get sealed off, but they are connected by a, a single tube called a siphuncle. And this creature could um, regulate the amount of gas that would go into these chambers and he could, that, that regulated his buoyancy then, so he could go up or down in the water column. And right here at the end, that's um, the living chamber right there. That's where the critter lived. Kind of looked like a squid with a shell. The Englewood Formation, the best formation of the Black Hills. Again, a lot, a lot of stuff. Look here. That's the one I did my um, dissertation on. Um, it's Devonian, Mississippian in age, uh, shallow marine, a very depauperate fauna because it was essentially a mud. Nothing could really live in this mud. Um, and again, it was very shallow. So any storm, any change in sea level would disrupt the bottom too, just because again, the very shallow um, conditions. It was deposited on an erosional surface. And so you do have thicker sections that are deposited in the low, low areas. And again, those low areas are more anoxic. So um, again, no oxygen, um, Lots of organics. Uh, they do have a little bit of uh, petroleum in some of the lower beds. You can break the rock and smell it, and you can smell the um, petroleum um, odor. And it's um, been related to the um, lodgepole limestone in Wyoming and also the Bakken Formation in North Dakota, which is a, a major petroleum producer. And there's always a transition zone that goes from the um, Englewood Formation into the Paasapa limestone. But there, and there's probably a break. It's been said that it's conformable, but there is a little break in time, a little um, hi, um, hiatus or diastem. 
between the um, Englewood and the Passapa limestone. Again, here's a view of it. It's a, essentially a black shale at the bottom. And as you go up in section, you get away from these anoxic conditions and you can see it gets lighter in color. And then you get, as you get up into the, near the Passapa limestone, which is more normal marine, you get into more normal marine um, conditions. But there's always that transition zone um, that you have to go through to get to the Passapa limestone. Again, typical view of just, it's a, an argillaceous or essentially a muddy limestone. There's the contact, um, the, the, the pinkish shaly Englewood underneath. This is the transition zone. It varies from six inches to maybe five feet around the hills. And it's, it's a little pinkish with some of the um, insoluble clay that was reworked from the Englewood is in here, but then it's like flipping a light switch when you get to that contact and you go into the Passapa limestone. Normal marine, none of this, um, the clay residue, anything like that is just totally different open marine environment. So quite a change from the restricted conditions of the Englewood. There's our reconstruction of the, the Clodotus, the Clododont shark, and some of the, the teeth below, and they got up to about six feet long. The Paasapa limestone, again, this was named by Newton and Jenny when they came out, um, oh, it was one of the earlier expeditions to the Black Hills to map the geology, and they named it the Gray Limestone, but Darton, when he was out here, um, named it the Paasapa limestone, which was Lakota for the Black Hills. It's Mississippian in age and thickens from the southern hills up into the Williston Basin. Um, the Passapa hosts essentially all the caves really in the Black Hills. And at the top, as you go into the Minnelusa Formation, there's a, a soil horizon and essentially a karstic surface developed along that contact. It's quite a cliff, cliff former, especially if you go through Spearfish Canyon um, in the northern hills. Um, spectacular views of the Passapa limestone there. And it is the major aquifer unit for the Black Hills. Right next to town, I mentioned the caves, Crystal Cave. Um, here's a passage in Jewel Cave, the third longest um, cave in the world. And there's over 200 miles of passage, passages there. And this, this could have changed. They are exploring these caves continually. Also, Wind Cave, there's some box work, which is one of the things that um, Wind Cave is famous for. And if you get to the hills, both these caves are very worthwhile to go see. And again, Wind Cave, seventh longest cave in the world, over 154 miles of passageways. And I'm sure that's changed because they are adding to that continually. Um, here is a um, small cave, Onyx Cave, south of Pringle. And if you can see the sort of hourglass feature here, that's what's called a breccia pipe. That was essentially where a artesian spring came to the surface eons ago. As the water table dropped, well, that spring gets abandoned. And so now all we're seeing is the vent, the conduit where that spring was working its way up through the rocks and essentially cementing the, the rubble and everything else around it. But that cave decided it was going to develop right there in that essentially plane of weakness where that um where that breccia pipe is. I've never seen another cave like that. So that's kind of unique. Um, also along with the karstic in the Passapa limestone, we have sinkholes. And this is Spring Cave. It flows essentially into the wall of the canyon and goes back in. And if you listen, you could hear a waterfall back in there. You didn't want to go too far back. It was slippery and if you know, slide and who knows where you're going to wind up down in a, a sinkhole someplace back there. But the whole creek disappears into the sinkhole. At the top of the Passapa limestone, I mentioned a contact with the uh, Minnelusa formation, and that's an erosional surface with a soil zone, the Terra Rosa that's developed. And here it is, this red soil zone filling a sinkhole that was developed right at the top, the contact with the Minnelusa formation. Um, this is a USGS publication that was put out. Um, the picture here is on Box Elder Creek, and it's about stream flow losses. And all the streams that flow, they essentially flow from the west to the east across the hills. And when the, they get to the east side, 
they go over these loss zones and a lot of the streams, when they hit the Pasapa, they disappear. And they don't, there's no more flow out past there unless we're having a wet season. And again, you can see the whirlpool right here where all that water just going down, just like a drain. And I've seen this in many streams around the hills. So right here on Box Elder Creek, this is Custer Gap. This is where the Custer Expedition in 1874 left the Black Hills to go up to um, back up to North Dakota. But right here, this is a lost zone. This picture was taken in May, so we'd probably had a lot of rain. Normally, this would be dry right through here. It would be a pond there, and as you get here, nothing. It would totally dry. But here, it's in spring, so we have enough flow that the lost zone is full. And so now the water is able to flow normally down the stream channel. Well, let's check this out. Here we're going to dump some rhodamine dye into Box Elder Creek. As you can see, it's quite a potent red dye. It doesn't take a whole lot to stain, to um, dye the water. There you can see the lost zone. Everybody's standing around that. Again, like it's going right down a drain there. Quite red. Okay, um, 0.6 miles away is gravel spring. And here's a fen, it's essentially a, a sort of a bog deposit that forms um, where springs come out. And often they have very unusual plant types and such, but right in the center there is where the spring surfaces. And you can almost set your watch at this. 56 minutes later, boom, there comes the dye out of that spring. And again, the flow, it's consistent. Pretty much, like I said, you can almost set your watch, 56 minutes. Well, let's take a little look at a map here. We dumped the dye in on um, Box Alder Creek over here and about 0.6 miles away, that's where Gravel Spring was and it's surfacing. Well, 30 days later at the um, City Spring as well in Rapid City, we're detecting dye. And so we had put the dye in the Box Elder Creek drainage, but now it's coming out in the Rapid Creek drainage. So in the subsurface, water doesn't care about surface drainages and drainage systems and basins and things like that. It flows where it has the conduits. It will flow down slope. And to get that far, I mean, you know, over a half a mile in about an hour, that's lightning speed as far as subsurface flow. And how can it do that? Hmm, there's a few flow conduits in the Pasapa limestone right there. And if you look at this, the outcrop, there's, you can't see any bedding. It's completely brecciated and rubbly. And there's, there's pore space between a bunch of this. And that probably occurred due to tertiary weathering. This is down in Pleasant Valley in the Southern Hills. But when the water goes in, well, it's gotta come out. And this is one of the springs on um, Spring Creek right here. And it's coming out of this fissure in the limestone. But during the winter, um, these areas are kept open because of spring water, it's about 40 some odd degrees. And so it helps keep these areas open during the, during the winter time. And one of the um, unusual rare birds that we have in the Black Hills here is the American Dipper or the water oozel. And he lives around these springs where they come out and he actually gets down, goes into the creek, walks along the creek bottom looking for his food. So he, he's subsurface, he goes underwater. And this is another, um, this is a major spring down in the Southern Hills, Cascade Springs. And it, it, the main first source is out of the um, Pasapa limestone but it also shares source with the uh, Minnelusa formation. It passes through that and he eventually surfaces um, as it's, after it's gone through the spearfish formation. But the USGS wrote um, this um, report here about this ep episodic sediment discharge because as it's stoping through these rocks, every now and then the spearfish formation, which is a bright red unit, something collapses in the subsurface. And for several days, if not more, the spring will flow red. They call it the reddening event. But it's because the, um, the water is act, uh, actively stoping or dissolving the rocks in the subsurface, things are collapsing. It's, it's totally, um, again, totally active. It's not a static system. 
Uh, the Minnelusa Formation overlies the um, Paasapa Formation. That was one of the um, early um, formations that was named out here, and that was by Winchell, who came out with the Custer Expedition. He named it the Minnelusa, which means um, rapid water in Lakota. And um, Darton grouped some stuff in there a little bit more, and um, everything essentially above the Paha, Paasapa limestone and below the Opeechee Shale. It's Pennsylvanian and Permian in age. Um, again, we have alternating sandstone shale, sandstone shale due to um, fluctuations in sea level, either due to um, seafloor spreading, um, glaciation events, and that's reflected in um, some of the rocks we'll see here in a minute. Um, and it's equivalent to um, the Casper Formation, Ten Sleep in Wyoming, quite a few surrounding formations and geologists at the time they a lot of times they didn't know that this unit was equivalent to that unit in another state so they'd name say the Minnelusa here and then later at from drilling to find out what's happening in the subsurface they do find oh well this unit is actually equivalent to this unit in this other state or this unit here so unfortunately we do have a mix of of terms for the same unit um, the Minnelusa Formation does produce oil in the southern Black Hills at the Barker Dome, and that's essentially the only place in the Black Hills proper that does produce oil. And the Minnelusa is the second most used aquifer unit in the Black Hills. And here we can see a, a good exposure. This is on the west side of town, sandstone, shale, sandstone, shale, sandstone. And the shaley parts are generally covered. The sandstone's resistant and um, is sticking out in relief. Same here, this is up in um, near Sand Creek in Wyoming. Again, just that cyc um, cyclothemic, cyclic sandstone shale, sandstone shale. Um, in the Northern Hills, um, this is an interesting um, feature along Boulder Canyon Road. And in the Minnelusa in the subsurface, you did have evaporates so like salt, gypsum, anhydrate. But if those things dissolved, you know, if you had a five, 10 foot bed, of, of that stuff here, you dissolve that, something's got to give. And so you get these what's called collapse features or collapse breccias from dissolution of units that were there. And then the whole formation essentially pancakes down and forms these disrupted um, beds just because things were taken out and things shifted when, they, um, when the beds collapsed and stabilized. I mentioned the oil well drilling down in the Barker Dome. And this was one of the early drill rigs. And this is not in a, a rotary type rig. This is what's known as a cable tool. And on the end of that cable, they'd attach essentially a sharpened chisel. And this boom would go up and down and up and down, moving that sharpened chisel. And that's what they'd use to pound their way into the ground. And after a while, they'd have to trip out of the hole run a baler down, get all the rock chips, run the, the, the bit back down the hole, and then keep that process up. And the, the, the wells at the Barker Dome were only about six to 800 feet um, deep, but you can imagine trying to drill a 600, six to 800 foot deep hole, one little pound at a time. That would be quite the, quite the task. The Opeechee Shell, that overlies the uh, Minnelusa Formation. Again, it's Permian. Um, it's a red bed. Let's see, really no fossils in it. It's equivalent to the Goose Egg Formation and the Phosphoria Formation as you go into Wyoming. So, um, and let's see. It was named for exposures along Battle Creek by Darton. And again, you can see he named, um, NH Darton named a lot of the exposure or a lot of the formations here in the Black Hills. Now there's a red bed. And again, that's typical, but you really, you don't see the Opeechee. It's not well exposed, about the only place you really see it is in a road cut. Um, here's some resistant beds in the bottom of it, but they're probably Caliche, old Caliche cemented beds. It's not real bedding that you'd see. And again, just very soft. So not very well exposed. Um, as you go to the top, if you look at the bottom here, you'll see this purple zone. And that is that red Opeechee shale, but it's been worked on by um, groundwater. And you can see this fracture here, that's in the Minicata limestone that, that overlies the Opeechee. 
water is coming down and it's again leaching the iron out and you can right near the fracture there's no reddish or purplish color it's beige the iron's gone it's been washed away so it's altered the iron and it's trying you can see probably another fracture down at the end there so again it's been removing the iron bit by bit over time now we'll go into the Minicata that we saw just overlying there. And again, Darton named it the purple limestone, changed it to the Minicata, which means um, hot springs in Lakota. Fairly uniform thickness, 30 to 40 feet. Um, it's mined throughout the Black Hills for aggregate, um, flagstone. Um, um, let's see. Um, let's see, for road gravel, ballast rock. and um, when you break that, it also has a petroliferous smell, and it's essentially equivalent to the Phosphoria Formation in Wyoming, which does produce a lot of um, um, oil. Shallow marine, whoops, shallow marine environments, essentially subtidal, intertidal, even subaerial. You see mud cracks and such in it. Hardly any fossils, mainly gastropods, ostracods, a few rare, very rare fish. Most bedding planes are a stylolite surface and a stylolite surface is essentially a pressure solution surface so that when the two beds were on top of each other and being crunched, it increased the solubility of the calcite and a lot of it dissolved. And so who knows how much thicker this unit was than it is now because just about every bedding plane has been dissolved a bit. It tends to form cliffs and box canyons which is the canyon that you walk up in and you come right to a dead end, like a wall. There is a view, this picture is actually in Darton's 1925 folio of the Central Black Hills. There's the um, Opeachy Shale underneath and the nice um, old cliff forming of the, um, the um, Minicata limestone. And it's dipping down to the west into the um, um, Boulder um, Park syncline. There's a view of the limestone again. You can see very thin bedded. And one of the neat features are these stromatolites. And you, you, if you look carefully, you can see these domal structures. The ones that form in the subtitle are essentially just, just layered like this at the bottom. They're called planar stromatolites. And as you get into more agitated, more current um, reworked water, you start to form these domes. And this one is a laterally linked domal hemispheroid. You can see these two are linked at the base. But as you get into more and more current energy, you just get isolated domes. And one of the best places if you want to see isolated domal stromatolites is Shark Bay in Australia. So you can take um, look at some pictures there and you'll just see these nice beautiful domes just sitting out in this lagoon all by themselves. That's a bucket list place. <laughs> um, here's a box fold in the Minicata. There's lots of small folding and that's probably just to slumping and down gravity movement. The bed was from the um, uh, force of gravity just going down and it was just kind of crunching that bed. And these box folds are fairly common. Also get sinkholes developing in, in the um, Minicata limestone, especially in the southern hills. Some areas it looks like they bomb the place. There's so many um, sinkholes when you look at an air photo. Here in Rapid City, um, they do mine it. And again, throughout around the hills, there are various quarries that they mine the, the, um, the limestone. And this is a, a large or anticline right here that they've mined. Essentially, there's a high wall over there. There's a high wall here and they've mined it down to the Opeachy. They saved the um, soil. They'll reclaim, the, put the soil back, get it to original contours, grass it over, and then move on to their next area. But again, that's widespread use of the Minicata throughout essentially Western South Dakota. Here's the Minalusa, or excuse me, Minicata spearfish contact, extremely sharp. I mean, that's one of those contacts you can put your finger right on. And so we'll move up into the spearfish on top. Another, whoops, another red bed unit, again named by um, Darton. And that forms what's called the Red Valley um, or the racetrack, but the Red Valley around the Black Hills, it's a soft unit. And so it's eroded out. And again, it's formed this red colored valley 
that encircles the whole Black Hills. If you look on a, a, a map of it, and it looks like a racetrack if you look at the um, uh, air photo. There are several gypsum beds in the um, in the formation, but the most prominent one is in the northern hills. It's the gypsum spring formation, and gypsum does um, dissolve through time. And if you put pressure on it, it flows. Um, so you got to be careful of that because again, it does dissolve and um, it does slump. Um, and the spearfish formation, as you follow that into Wyoming, is equivalent to the chugwater formation. Here we're seeing the, the spearfish, again, red bed, and these white layers through here. Those are the gypsum beds. And in Rapid City here, there's two main gypsum beds near the top of the formation, each about 20 feet thick. Here's a road cut. And again, if you cut into it, it's, it's literally as hard as a rock. But it, again, it will dissolve. And if you put pressure on it, it does flow over time. Um, gypsum dissolves, as I mentioned. And when you do that, well, it does form sinkholes. This one's near Beulah, Wyoming. And one of the most famous sinkholes near Beulah, Wyoming is the um, Boar Buff Buffalo, the Vore <laughs> Buffalo Jump, which again is well worth seeing. It's where the Native Americans ran the buffalo across the prairie and they didn't see the, the sinkhole coming up, which is probably about 50 feet deep there. And they'd go in there and fall over the cliff and then the, the natives would go in there and butcher them. And they found University of Wyoming was working that project for a number of years. Um, in the Northern Hills, this is Cox Lake, but also Mud Lake and Mirror Lake is up there. Well, these are water-filled sinkholes in the spearfish formation. So three of our larger lakes in the Northern Hills are formed in sinkholes. The Sundance Formation, again, named by Darton. Now we're moving up into the Jurassic. Um, in the 1940s, the um, spearfish, or excuse me, the Sundance Formation was divided up into the Canyon Springs, Stockade Beaver, Hewlett, Lack, and Redwater Shale members. This is right south of Rapid City. This is just a little skiff of the um, um, Canyon Springs member. The grass colored covered slope is the um, Stockade Beaver Shale, and that's capped by the um, resistant Hewlett Sandstone. And the Hewlett Sandstone is just loaded with all kinds of ripple marks, current ripple marks, oscillation ripple marks, every ripple mark you could think of, as well as all kinds of burrows. This is uh, essentially a complete section down by the LAK Reservoir in Wyoming. The unit at the bottom, that's the um, Canyon Springs, the um, Stockade Beaver Shale, Hewlett Sandstone. And if you can see a little bit there, it's hard to see, I know, but it's reddish colored a little bit. That's the LAK member. That thing is hardly ever exposed. And then there's the, um, the Redwater Shale and then overlain by the um, Lakota Formation at the top. But that's one of the best exposures. Um, and that's where the LAK uh, member was named for down there. The Oompapa sandstone, um, again, is Jurassic in age, um, named by Darton after the Oompapa tribe of, of the Lakota. And it's named after Oompapa Peak in the Southern Hills. Um, and where you find the, the Morrison formation overlies it, but where that is, the Oompapa is thin, and where the um, Morrison is thin, the Oompapa is thick. You have this sort of coeval existence between the two formations. But it's, it's a bright white, typically friable, fine to medium grain sandstone, and essentially it was a near shore sand dune deposit. No fossils have been found in that. There's a picture of it. Again, nice bright white. You could just put your hand in there and scoop that sand out just like sand in a sandbox. And that is mined locally for use either in, in the cement industry here. And I think they also in the past used it for filters. The Morrison Formation, which overlies the um, Oompapa, was named the Beulah Shale initially, but then Darton extended the name from Colorado up here. You recognize that that's probably the same formation that they have down there and also in um, Utah. Uh, it's about 100 th feet thick. 
And again, as in Colorado and especially Utah, where Dinosaur National Monument is, we do have some dinosaurs here in the Black Hills. The type um, specimen of the sauropod, or essentially Dino the dinosaur, um, Barasaur came from um, the um, Morrison Formation near Piedmont, oh, about 20 miles north of um, Rapid City. And it's a freshwater deposit near shore, essentially of swamps and marshes and streams and floodplains, but with some component of volcanic ash being blown in. There's a picture of it. It's, it's again, fairly, it's variegated. It comes in multiple colors. Here's some browns, reds, grays, tans, and you do get purples and yellows, and it's quite, quite a mix of colors. And you can see it's kind of has a popcorn texture. Well, that's from the um, the swelling effect of the um, bentonite that's incorporated in the shale here. The Indian Cara now are moving into the Cretaceous and Darton included the Lakota sandstone, um, which has several members at, um, within it and also the Fall River Formation. And this is Lower Cretaceous and that's right about the time when flowering plants were coming about. We didn't have any flowers before this. Um, Lakota, Lakota formation, again, named by Darton. Um, let's see, it has several members in it. Uh, mo so, uh, most are restricted to the Southern Hills, mainly the, um, the Minnewas limestone and the Fuzon shale. It gets up to about 500 feet thick and it thickens um, essentially to the south and over into Wyoming. It was a terrestrial freshwater, again, swamps and marshes uh, uh, type of environment. There's petrified wood, coal, actually dinosaur fossils, um, primitive ganoid scale fishes that you can, that are very rare, but you can find the scales. And this is part of the, it's the lower part of the Indian Cara aquifer. So another aquifer unit that's used in the hills here. This is a view of the um, Lakota formation at the Buffalo Gap uh, monocline in the Southern Hills. And we're coming down over the monocline and these beds actually almost go to 90 degrees vertical um, when they drape over the monocline. There's a fault running this way underneath that, formed this, that forms this thing. So the beds, these beds are overlying that fault and kind of drape over it. So this block out here moved up and the block over here went down. So this is draping over a Precambrian block way down in the subsurface. Um, typical view of it, sandstone with thin shales. Similar to the Fall River Formation, which again, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Russell named this one uh, for because it's best exposed along Fall River in the Southern Black Hills again, uh, Cretaceous, and we're going up into the marine here. So we're kind of leaving these freshwater environments going more into a near shore marine. Um, lower beds, it goes from lower thick bedded stuff and then more shaly as you get to the top. And again, part of the Indian Cara aquifer. There is a view in the Southern Hills, alternating sandstones and shales, but a lot of the shales are just loaded with plant fossils and lower Cretaceous plants, so kind of a uh, neat locality. The Grineros group includes um, Skull Creek, Newcastle, the Maori, and the Belle Fouche, again, all grouped together by Darton. We'll briefly just go through these. The Skull Creek Shale, um, it's not very well exposed, named for Skull Creek over in Wyoming. Um, it does have some rare marine reptiles and invertebrates in it. We'll take a look here. It's essentially a typical black Cretaceous shale. Um, and here overlying it is a sandstone, which we'll see here coming up. And that's our Newcastle sandstone. I know we're moving through these pretty quickly. Um, again, that's um, these were essentially river channel deposits from a large um, river system that was coming across Wyoming. And so these sandstone um, deposits, they're very discontinuous. You could walk a few hundred yards one way or another along um, strike there and you'd get out of it. But there's a lot of plant fragments in here, coal, um, 
again, this it was deposited on this very wide delta coming out from Wyoming with all these coal swamps. And again, a typical picture of it, it's not very thick, 10, 20 to maybe 40 feet thick, but it is equivalent to the muddy sandstone in Wyoming, which does produce some um, um, gas. But unfortunately, none here in South Dakota. Um, in the Southern Hills, we have um, Cascade Falls, which is a really neat place to go. There's a little um, park down there, but the, there's a whole series of falls along the, um, 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 the creek here. And again, they're flowing over the, the Newcastle sandstone, which is making all these, this whole series of little falls and, and almost like little, little mini jacuzzis with these little waterfall areas. The Maori Shale, again, Darton naming these. Um, typical black shale, and it does support pine growth, unlike one of the shales that's above it, the Belle Fouche. It's a little lighter in color. There's volcanic ash in here. And one of the units that's at the top of the uh, Maori is the clay spur bentonite. That's mined um, actually up near Belle Fouche and also over by Colony, Wyoming for the bentonite. There's fish scales throughout and rare marine reptiles, essentially plesiosaurs. This um, tree colored covered ridge that's coming out. That's a little anticline that's coming off the, the Black Hills, which are off to the right there. And I mentioned that the pine trees grow on the Maori. So they took advantage of this, the Maori shale that was brought to the surface along the anticline, the grass covered stuff. That's the Belfouche shale that's covered um, with the grass. It doesn't support the pine tree growth. Again, typical black shale. You can see the, the fine bedding in there. Very similar to the Belle Fouche. It's when you're out mapping these units, it's hard, very hard to tell them apart. Um, it's a little darker gray than the Maori that we just looked at. And again, though, there's thin bentonite beds, but right along the contact between the two, there are some concretions. But unless you can find that concretion layer, it's really hard to tell the contact between the two units. And again, though, contains fish, scale, fish scales, rare. Um, marine reptiles, some ammonites, so similar in appearance to the bell. And as we can see here, it looks a lot similar to the bell. If we look near the bottom, there's a thin little beige layer. That's a thin bentonite um, bed. And that clay spur that's in the northern hills probably gets up to oh, maybe 10 to 15 feet thick of, of bentonite. And that's the one that they mine in the northern hills. The Greenhorn limestone, we're getting up near the, the top of the section here. That was named near Greenhorn Station in Colorado, but then Darton brought the name up here into South Dakota. He recognized that, oh, that's probably the same unit. And um, the most prominent thing on that is the um, a limestone unit, the upper part of it, which is loaded with the bivalve mytaloides. It used to be called Inoceramus, these big, essentially clams, oyster looking things. And it forms that, that resistant unit, forms a low um, cuesta encircling the entire Black Hills. And if you're out mapping, you find you're running into a lot of yucca, well, that's a kind of an indicator that, oh, we may be getting into the, the Greenhorn Formation. And there's a view of the upper limestone. And that's about really the only resistant thing you see. And it's, it's maybe 40, 50 feet thick or so. And as you go to the bottom, that's again, black shale. It's not really real uh, resistant, doesn't make good exposures. So the main thing that you do see is that upper, um, more resistant limey unit. The Carlisle shale, um, again, named for units down in Colorado, but again, Darton kind of recognized some things and, oh, let's name it the Carlisle, let's bring that up here. Um, and it was later divided into three different units, Pool Creek at the bottom, Turner Sandy, Turner Sandy member in the middle, and Sage Breaks member at the top. It contains concretions, abundant ammonites in some of these units, and in that Turner Sandy layer, very abundant shark teeth. This is a picture of the contact with the um, Pool Creek shale at the bottom and the Turner Sandy member at the top here. Um, again, typical black shale. The Turner Sandy member, again, it gets some of it's very coarse grained um, sandstone, almost a conglomerate, and some of it is actually a shark tooth conglomerate. It's quite neat looking stuff. 
Um, the upper part, the um, sage breaks, remember, um, very cyclic bedding, sandstone, shale, sandstone, shale. It's called flacer bedding. Again, this very cyclic sedimentation, um, pulses of, of coarser sediments coming in to a more quiet basin. Okay, moving up in this um, section, the Niobrara Formation. Um, Meek and Hayden named that. That was some of the first expo um, expeditions out west here in the 1860s um, to map the geology. The Newton and Jenny, when they came out later in the Black Hills, um, recognized it, and then they applied the name out here, the Niobrara. It's, it's very well exposed in Kansas and out to the east. Um, it contains a lot of bentonite beds, concretions, reptiles, and beds of this uh, very small oyster, Pseudoperna. And it, it was, it's divided up in the Fort Hayes limestone and the Smoky Hill chalk, which really you can't identify that well out to the west here, but as you get into eastern South Dakota and in more into um, Kansas and those areas out east, you can. It's more easily dividable. Again, typical, it's essentially a marl to a chalk. And some of the lithified beds you can actually take and use to write on a blackboard. Very light colored. Okay, the, the last whew, um, exposure for the Cretaceous around the hills is the Pier Shale, um, named after Fort Pier along the Missouri River. And it's very thick, over 2,000 feet. I mean, I bet you guys out in Minnesota have some of that in southern Minnesota. I know we have it in east, south, southern, southeastern South Dakota. There's multiple members in it. It's really hard to differ, differenti uh, differentiate the members and correlate them. There's widespread bentonite beds, concretions, forms prominent slumps. Whoops. One of the uh, very prominent things in the... Um, the pier are the concretions that have uh, beautiful ammonites, a uh, very um, extensive um, invertebrate fauna, but also bony fish, birds, Hesperornis, pterosaurs, mosasaurs, plesiosaurs for vertebrates. It's quite um, diverse. Um, here's typical pier shale, your gray pier shale. And again, it's got that popcorn texture from some of the bentonite that's included that's been incorporated in here. I mean, a windblown volcanic ash that settles in onto the ocean and gets incorporated into the sediment. I mentioned the slumping. This is along the um, um oh uh, let's see, I think along Rapid Creek um, in the southern hills. These are north-facing exposures, but you can again see prominent slumping. You wouldn't probably wouldn't want to put your house on one of these things, these bluffs. It would be a mobile home after a while. Now we'll move up into, um, out of the, um, the Mesozoic there and into the tertiary with the intrusive rocks. And they extend in a line essentially from Bear Butte up to Missouri Butte, um, North 70 West, probably along a, an ancient liniment or a plane of weakness there. Most of the Bear Lodge Mountains is composed of tertiary intrusives. Um, there was an upper, upper um, source, so probably from deep burial of some of these Precambrian units, they were getting melted, again, just from their deep burial, and then eventually making their way to the surface. Well, actually, most of these, there's only one area where the, in the hills where the um, intrusives actually made it to the surface. The rest of these actually, though, were intruded underneath, um, so subsurface. And a lot of these tertiary intrusives form a lot of the higher peaks in the northern hills, and some are associated with economic mineral deposits. Just a picture of some of the varieties. Phonolite, another phonolite. There's a rhyolite, rhyolite, rhyolite. You can see a, a variation between rhyolite. Um, that's probably a trachyte. Um, there is, I think, a latite. Um, that, I think, is another latite. So again, a, a, this is just a small small sampling of the huge variety of these things in the northern hills. Um, Bear Butte, and there's a, we have Bear Butte State Park there, a, a nice little state park with a good visitor center and everything, but that's a rhyolitic intrusive. Crow Peak in the northern hills, that's a latite, a latitic intrusive. So again, some of these larger peaks. Terry Peak with all the um, radio towers, and that has ski 
tra um, ski trails on it. That's a, a alkaline rhyolite intrusive. There's a view of the open cut again, all these, again, rhyolite intrusives. I've mentioned the foliation near the beginning of the talk. Well, these little dikes, they are following the foliation that's within the um, poor man and the homestake formations. That's why they're in these nice straight lines. They're following that, that fabric in the rock, that plane of weakness. Bridal Veil Falls, that flows over um, a phonolite and that's in Spearfish Canyon. Here's a rhyolitic um, intrusive, but and as these things were coming up through the lower, the Precambrian rocks in the basement, the very subsurface, they were ripping parts of the Precambrian off and incorporating them into the, the molten magma. And that's what all these black chunks are. These are parts, these are chunks of Precambrian schist that were ripped off the wall. They're known as xenoliths. And some of them can actually get brought in and then totally remelted and incorporated into the melt, um, essentially altering the, altering the composition of the, of the melt itself if you get enough of these um, xenoliths that remelt. A weathered rhyolitic sill in the northern hills, and it must have been softer in the middle because you can see it's in a little gully right here, how the, the flow has turned that almost into a little channel, just weathered it right out. Talus slope of quartz latite porphyry on Crow Peak. I've walked up this thing. You take three steps up, slide back two. Three steps up, slide back two. It took a while to get up that slope. And you can see how a lot of these igneous rocks, they're very hard. And from the um, freeze-thaw cycle, they just break apart the, the, um, into these very angular fragments. But sometimes, you'll get what's known as gruss. And from the weathering, it actually weathers the intrusives, the minerals apart. It breaks them along the um, actual mineral grains and then the minerals themselves, it can break apart the crystal um, cleavages. And you can see on the bottom, it almost looks like this stuff has flowed down the hill. It's like sand. You could just reach your hand in there and pick up a, a big scoop full of this um, a weathered igneous rock. I think it was a, a latite originally that's weathering here. Now we're getting up into the terrace levels in the Black Hills. So essentially getting up from the tertiary, maybe about 30 million years ago, generally up to the present. And these terrace levels were de described by Plumlee. We have very old ones, tertiary age, which are probably equivalent in age to the sediments of the Badlands. But then he mapped out the Mountain Meadow, Rapid, um, Rapid Creek, Sturgis, Bear Butte, and Farmingdale terraces going from oldest was the mountain meadow, the youngest is the Farmingdale, and then our modern floodplains. <clears throat> and a lot of these gravels, they're mined throughout the hills for their sand and gravel, the aggregate resource. This is um, west of Rockerville, up in the hills, these flat surfaces, that's actually a gravel surface. You don't see the gravel, but if you dig down into that, you would find, yes, this whole thing is a nice, flat, essentially a terrace deposit that was laid down by streams back from 30 million years ago up till eh, maybe tens of thousands. We don't really know. There's no fossils in them really to, to um, date. And those um, surfaces are very flat. They're gravel. They drain well. And so developers like to put houses on these things. And so a lot of these flat gravel um, Terrace gravels have been turned into developments because, again, they're, they're open, they're flat, um, not many trees on them. Um, there's a view of the uh, Mountain Meadow Terrace in the northern hills. You can see all the cobbles. That's fairly thick. That's probably 40, 50 feet thick at least. And that's the oldest one that um, Plumley mapped. Um, out um, just west of Rapid City, this is, um, again, it's unknown, it's I think mapped as a undifferentiated tertiary gravel, but it's on the Minnelusa formation. And you can see the, the sand here underneath. And again, when this was deposited, there was a lot of water to bring in all these this gravel and everything. And the water eventually dissolved the cement that was in the Minnelusa formation. So again, you could reach in here and just scoop the sand out, just like sand in a sandbox, it's so loose. And again, these, 
you know, the, the, um, when they do perk tests, when they want to put in septic systems and stuff in the developments, I mean, it always perks. I mean, you got gravel and sand. So there's not much to stop um, things from perking down in there. You don't want it to perk too fast is one of the problems. And two, when you put in um, subdivisions out in the Black Hills, they have to have septic systems. Well, every one of those dots is a septic tank. And this is out west of Rapid City. And that shows some of the density in some of these developments. And this is um, actually developed on the Minnelusa Formation. So whatever is here um, is going eventually going down into the Minnelusa Formation, our second most used aquifer unit in the hills. And again, things like nitrates, chlorides, pharmaceuticals, cleaning products, they don't degrade in the subsurface. They keep traveling and they'll travel right on down to Rapid City. So we have to be very careful with our development and use of, of land and everything else and just be conscientious that this water, eventually somebody is possibly gonna be drinking it. Here's two of the lowest level tertiary level or gravel levels in the Black Hills, the Sturgis level out here and the lowest level, the Farmingdale level. And that's a modern floodplain right there. And again, these are mined for gravel throughout the Black Hills. I like this picture. This is, developed, this is on one of the um, gravels in the northern Black Hills along Nemo Road. But this is the grave of James um, A. King. He was the only fatality on the Custer Expedition of 1874. And again, he's buried up there on, um, along Nemo Road and the horses paying respects there. And one of the neater, um, more recent deposits and occurrences of things in the Black Hills is at the Mammoth site, and that's down by Hot Springs. And they have a very good um, oh, a visitor center there which, with a lot of good, good exhibits. And of course, you can see the excavation where the mammoths are, and it was a sinkhole at the time. And the mammoths would come down to drink well, it was kind of steep. Well, they'd lose their footing, go into the sinkhole. Well, they'd want to get back out. They can't. So they essentially keep trying and trying and they tire themselves out, eventually drowned. And this is about 26,000 years ago. And I believe they have, they've got the remains of, I think it's 52 different mammoths that met their, um, their demise there in the, um, the sinkhole. And if you look at the, the wall there, you can see the very fine bedding, seasonal probably, seasonal bedding of the sinkhole. Well, that brings us up to almost the present, um, which is pretty good. And so that is the end for now. And we can go through some questions here at the end. And so that will make room for Brian to come in and give his talk. So what do I, if I, let's see, end the slide. Oops. Yeah, you want to go to share screen and stop sharing. Okay. Uh-oh. Now, darn it. Share. Oh, <laughs> that's not it. I hit the wrong button someplace. Heck. Come on. Where would I cannot find it? Where would that be? Whoops. Doggone it. Actually, Brian, if you start sharing, I think you can can override. No, why? Oh. Oh, I just, there we oh, go. Got it. Yeah, Ooh, my, uh, I, I stopped it. Oh, perfect. Everybody can see my screen? Yep. The pointer moving around? Okay. Yep. Looks yep. good. All right. We got time for another presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I tried <Anyways>. to be brief. <laughs> 
All right, so uh, part two tonight. Gold in the Black Hills. My name is Brian Fania. I'm CPG, Environmental Scientist 3 for Geological Survey. And uh, let's talk a little bit about Gold in the Black Hills. All starts in the early 1800s. Indians were basically turning in a little bit of gold at Fort Laramie Trading Post down in Wyoming and along the Missouri River. Uh, most of that was assumed to be coming out from the Black Hills during the early 1800s. There was a Catholic missionary by the name of Father DeSmit. Uh, he was informed by Indians of the presence of gold, and he told them, you should not be telling anybody about this. Uh, so they did keep it secret just for a little bit. That's a picture of Fort Laramie, by the way. It wasn't until 1833 that we actually have written evidence of gold being in the Black Hills, if you believe the Thoen Stone. It was discovered in 1887. Ezra Kind was the one who carved in some really nice cursive on this stone about uh, a group that he was with uh, that came to the Black Hills in, the 30, in 1833, got all the gold that they could get, but the Indians were hunting them down, killed all their horses, killed the party, he's lost his gun, so he decided to carve all this into a rock. Um, you can actually go see this when you go to Deadwood at the Adams Museum. It's on display. And uh, most experts believe it's legitimate. It's not some type of fake or forgery. Um, but you can go and judge for yourself. In 1852, Captain Douglas had a party that was approached, this was down in Laramie, Fort Laramie, uh, was approached by a fur trapper who told them about gold in the hills. He actually sent 30 men uh, from his party with the trapper to go prospect the area. On the way, they did find gold. Uh, eight, on the way back, eight of the men overtook the party. They, they, they raced back before the rest of the party could get back and reported it to the main party. But the main party uh, decided not to go check out the gold prospects. Uh, There's too much Indian trouble up there. And the rest of those 22 men were never heard from again either. So either they got killed by Indians or maybe they went back and mined it out. Who knows? Um, in 1853, uh, Lieutenant John Mullen had a party, a small company that was going through the area. He was an experienced miner from California. Um, he did see promising gold prospects, but he never told any of his men in, uh, in that until uh, way later on because he was afraid that they would actually leave his group and, uh, and the company would be disbanded. And Jim Bridger, who everybody probably has heard of, uh, Mountain Man of the West, constantly made reports of great wealth in the Black Hills, but Jim Bridger was also a very constant liar and no one ever took him seriously. So they never followed up on what he had spoken about. So over 50 some years, actually about, we'll just say, keep going here, but uh, about 70 years had passed before real gold discovery in the Black Hills, even though for 70 years, people kept mentioning it. 1865 again, a couple of Swedes, were in the Fort Laramie uh, Fort there and said they found $7,000 worth of gold. They went back, never heard from again. And F.V. Hayden in 66 was a geologist with the Smithsonian Institute, also made a trip to the Black Hills. He wasn't really interested in looking for mineral wealth or other things, but he did indicate that there was rich gold deposits. Must have been that nobody read his report when he got back because it wasn't until 1874 when the Custer Expedition finally came to the Black Hills. And part of the Custer Expedition was the look to see if these claims of gold that people keep talking about are really there, but it was also to see about establishing a new fort um, in, the, in, in and around the area. And you gotta remember it, at this point in time, this is Indian reservation land. This is uh, Indian territory. Uh, the U.S. government said, you know, this is all yours um, and white people won't be coming in here. Well, as soon as Horatio Ross, and that's the guy down here on the bottom, this guy, 
He's with the Custer Expedition. As soon as he found gold, it was official, officially recorded, officially found. You can go uh, to where he found gold right here along French Creek and see the exact spot. Supposedly he pulled a rose bush up off the ground, dumped the dirt into his gold pan, panned it out and said he was finding gold dust. I wish it was that easy. Uh, I've never experienced that in my life, gold panning, but that's supposedly how he found it. And as soon as he did that, he obviously found gold because he staked, claim, staked claims along French Creek that he would come back to when it opened back up. So he had first claim on it. If you want to go see, if you're, I'm assuming a lot of people go to the Black Hills since you're out there in Minnesota or will be coming. But if you ever want to see where gold was first discovered in the Black Hills, it's not easy to find. Go to Custer City, head east towards Custer State Park. You'll start coming along a little area, a little dirt road here called American Center Road. And in these trees, which are covered up, is a sign that says gold was discovered down this road. You'll uh, drive down this road all the way to here, and you'll actually end up seeing this little sign. And this little sign actually says, first gold discovered in the Black Hills, blah, blah, blah. And right out on the field here, I keep losing my pointer, right out on the field here is actually where Custer camped and everything and where gold was discovered by Horatio Ross, along with William T. McKay. He was his partner, but Horatio gets all the credit. Um, so you can actually go see that today if you wanted to. That was in the summer. In the December, in December of 1874, we had the first party come in here to start mining for gold. And remember, this is Indian territory. They're not supposed to be in here. So they evaded soldiers and Indians to establish <laughs> themselves up on French Creek. Uh, they built the stockade. You can actually still see a replica of that stockade today. It's in Custer State Park. So uh, if you go to the first spot that Horatio Ross panned for gold, Continue down the highway towards Custer State Park. Look off to your right uh, before you enter the park and you'll actually see the stockade right here. It's actually, the, the Gordon Party was actually considered the first mining operation in the Black Hills because they were successful in getting 70 ounces of gold out of the ground before the soldiers ejected them out of their stockade and they didn't put up a fight they knew they weren't supposed to be there the stockade was to protect them from indians so you can see all the soldiers this is actually a picture of them ejecting them all the soldiers there lined up in front of the stockade took a nice picture and then escorted them out of the black hills in 1875 there was the newton and jenny expedition this was to ascertain the extent of the value of these gold deposits that the custer expedition actually found out it was a government expedition to geologists this is the kicker so the conclusion with newton and jenny was that yeah there's probably some good gold here but it's mixed up with quote a hell of a site of dirt meaning they're not poor man's diggings they're not diggings where you're going to dig down three feet to bedrock and you're going to have nuggets galore and come home a rich person. It means you're going to dig down 20, 30 feet or more of soil before you're actually going to hit anything that's gold related. And it's going to take a heck of a lot of water and a heck of a lot of time to remove all this dirt and overburden and everything like that to actually get the gold out. But it didn't matter. This report came out so late that the established that, that the newspapers in the east had already basically hyped it up to the point where they already had thousands of prospectors in the hills and that was before the report was even published and here's actually a picture uh, of uh, an excerpt from one of the newspapers and i'm not going to read it all to save time you can go back and watch the video that's being recorded here if you wanted to read it but it's so funny because if we're all complaining about fake news today people it's existed for hundreds of years because all you got to do is read this newspaper article and they're saying how like professor jenny finds tons of gold it's time to go to the hills come on everybody let's go out so i mean uh it i, I summed it up for you in that uh they'll find out the hard way as you'll see as we continue along here um 
1875, 1876, that's the gold rush of the Black Hills. It all starts down in Custer, right along French Creek, right where Horatio Ross started. It's placer deposits that they're looking at, dirt digging, okay? So basically, why are they coming up from the south? Well, you had Fort Laramie down there, but you also had Cheyenne and you also had Sydney, Nebraska. Those were two stops on the railroad. The, after those stops, you could take your trail or work your way up to the hills. It was the fastest and quickest way. As a matter of fact, after this was all established, those were the two main stage routes to get up to the Black Hills because uh, railroad basically never really came to it until way later. So it starts in Custer City, starts along French Creek, what they end up finding out is exactly what Jenny had said. Placers proved to be low grade. A lot of dirt to move, need a lot of manpower. It's not paying out. People are going broke, hungry, and cold. So what do they do? They start moving north in the Black Hills and to the east in the Black Hills. They find more low grade placer deposits along Spring Creek, Castle Creek, Rapid Creek. There's dry placers down in Rockerville. It wasn't until they got to the northern hills along Blacktail Gulch, Bobtail Gulch, and Deadwood Gulch, Blacktail and Bobtail drain into Deadwood Gulch, which then drains into Whitewood Creek, that they actually found rich placers, and that was in the Deadwood area. In 1876, because of those rich placers being found, the city of Deadwood was actually established, and it was considered the richest mile in America reaches a population of 25,000. That picture down on the lower right is a picture of Deadwood in 1876. It's booming. And that's, a, that's an actual picture. Uh, and, and so the army can't keep the white people out. Basically in 1877, they signed a treaty with the Native Americans. It opened up the Black Hills. Okay, so they were digging. We're going to get into some geology here along with history. So what they're digging is placer deposits, placer gold deposits. I call it dirt digging because that's basically what you're doing. You're digging in an unconsolidated gravel, more or less. Um, there's two different types. We'll break it down into two different main groups of placer deposits, one being eluvial, the other being alluvial. Eluvial, I consider a dry deposit. Alluvial, I consider a wet deposit. Ones that we deal with here in the Black Hills are the first two on the dry deposits. Usually we got a residual deposit or a hillside deposit. That's where it first starts. If you got a hard rock deposit that has gold in it and it starts to weather out, it'll form a residual plaster deposit. It disintegrates, it erodes, it just falls right there, legs right where the deposit is. Usually, in, it, it's usually considered pockets of good placer gold if you can actually find one. At that point, it's a, considered a hillside deposit as it eventually moves its way down to the gulches and the streams. It doesn't have to be on bedrock. Matter of fact, it more than likely isn't on bedrock because if it was in my, on bedrock covered with a ton of soil and gravel, it would never move down to the creek. So it's generally, you have wind blowing the sediment away, big rainstorms or whatever, slowly moving that gold down towards the gulches and the streams. The last dry deposit is an Aeolian deposit. It's not found in the Black Hills. These are things that you find in more of like desert landscapes, desert pavement, things like that. The second picture right here would be an Aeolian deposit. If we go back up to residual and hillside, your residual deposit would be right about here. This is your hillside deposit. <clears throat> okay, uh, Eolian mainly, uh, it's mainly wind that's responsible for all the other sediments that are being blown away and then it lags down and leaves that, that nice plaster deposit that you see right along through here. Alluvial deposits, wet deposits, it requires water. The one that we all think of is the stream creek deposit right in here, right in the gulch. Gold is generally on the bedrock. It uses density sorting along with the fluid movement because of that. If you drop the heavies down to the bedrock, everybody probably watches Gold Rush, gotta get down to bedrock. Well, that's the case if you're on the stream or the creek, okay? If you're in a gulch setting, it's the same thing as a stream or a creek because it had water in it. it. It sorted the gold and 
uh, density, sorted it down to the bedrock, but now it's dry. So there's no water left in that gulch. It's just a dry gulch. They, they also refer to that as a gulch placer. Venture terrace placers, uh, these levels right up in here, you got to remember that a creek erodes uh, over time. Um, as it does, it, it moves, it'll start to form that, that valley and it, that stream moves, back, meanders back and forth. And as it erodes down, it leaves bench or terrace gravels as it comes down through. That doesn't have to be just in the quaternary time though, because you can have and I'm not saying this is in the Black Hills, I've never seen deposits a thousand feet above today's drainages, but if you get out to California or things like that, you will actually see tertiary gravel deposits that are over a thousand, up to a thousand feet above today's drainage levels. Here in the Black Hills, I'd say the highest ones that I've observed were right around 350 feet above today's drainages. But anyways, and then the last alluvial one is a beach deposit. Uh, we don't have beach deposits here in the Black Hills. It's just where a large river or stream that has a lot of gold in it ends up hitting a large body of water. So you get that density sorting from the stream and creek, but once you hit the large water, you know, you're not generally getting large nuggets there. It's usually dust uh, and you get sorting through wave action. So you end up starting to get these nice thin layers of gold, as you can see right in through here. Obviously, it can sort itself down to the bedrock. Um, these are kind of like beached blaster deposits you might find in like Nome, Alaska or something or out in Oregon. Okay, let's get back to some of the history. So they're mining the placer deposits. What do miners do then as they're working for placer deposits? Here's a little creek going along through here. They find gold here, they find gold here, 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 but no gold here. Well, that is a good indication then that, hey, the main deposits are probably gonna start being up the hillside. So what are they doing? They start triangulating. They start going back and forth along the hillside, narrowing it down till they get up to a point and do it again and do it again and maybe do it again. And eventually they'll lead to the load deposit where the gold is actually coming from. This process is actually a process called loaming. Uh, you can still do it today if you wanted to find a load deposit. It's very simple. Just pan your way up the creek to where there's no gold, then start looking for your hillside deposits. That'll lead you up to your residual deposit and eventually find your load. Real quick, before I get into the different types of load deposits here in the Black Hills, let's just talk about very basic gold mineralization. You need a heat source. This right here would be basically a granite, a hot, could be a, a, any type of intrusive, any type of magma, but it's a heat source. Here you have your, your, your limestones, your schists, whatever, uh, allowing that water to come down through, rainwater or meteoritic water. As that starts to come down through, you'll encounter the heat source. That heat source then makes that fluid nice and hot, starts dissolving uh, any of the mineralogy or any of the minerals that are in the uh, host rock coming through here. And then once it gets so hot, it'll start bringing those, uh, those fluids back to the surface, carrying those minerals. And then when the heat and pressure is correct, it'll start precipitating out those minerals into gold deposits. Then everything gets eroded off. And that's why generally, if you find any type of igneous rock around and you're finding quartz veining or other type of veining, in the schist surrounded or whatnot, there's a good indication that you, with other mineralogy, or if you find any residual deposits that it could lead you to some type of gold deposit. Okay, so let's get back to uh, the Black Hills here. The placer mining leads to the load deposit. The first load mine that was discovered in the Black Hills is considered a syngenetic straniform iron formation hosted gold deposit. And the first, the first mine or the first load that was discovered was the giant and the old Abe right here, the old Abe and the giant. You'll notice that right next to it is the home stake. And that was the next one that was found pretty ironic. Ah, oh, my buddy's got two claims next to me. I should just look, you know, a little further to the West and sure enough, yeah, Manuel Moses, Hank Henry, they find the home stake mine. They found that in 1876. 
a year later from when J.B. Pearson founded the giant in the old Abe in 1875. Looking at this map real quick, just so that you're aware, this is Deadwood Gulch right here, Central City. Town of Deadwood would be way over here. This is Bobtail Gulch. Blacktail Gulch actually is right here and it'll come in this way. If you remember, I said Blacktail, Bobtail, and Deadwood Gulch, which drains into Whitewood Creek. That was considered the richest mile. Okay, 1876, back to the Homestake Mine. It was discovered. Pretty soon after that, it was sold to George Hurst for $70,000. Uh, that was a lot of money back in the day. Uh, I actually did a calculation on that before doing this presentation, and it equivalates out to $1.6 million in today's money. Would have you sold that mine back then, you know, to get $1.6 million? I sure would have. I mean, invest that at 5%, $75,000 a year, you're set for life, right? Uh, or at least comfortable for life. But being the, what we know now and how much gold actually came out of the homestake, maybe they would have had a change of heart, but they probably didn't have the capital anyways to, to get it running. So selling it to Hearst was probably their best in their best interest. Uh, the mine uh, up until its closing in 2002 was the longest running gold mine in the United States. At some points, it was the largest producing gold mine in the United States, uh, as well as North America. And on those main, uh, largest producing years, they're averaging around 300,000 ounces troy yearly they mined down in that mine the, to about eight thousand feet uh, below the surface they explored up to nine thousand feet below the surface just to give you an idea homestake is in lead lead is about a mile high so they actually mined three thousand feet below uh ocean level sea level uh, and explored four thousand feet below sea level more or less right Early ore grade, right around 0 0.3 ounces per ton. On average, they were getting about 0 0.16 ounces per ton. Now, the map that I'm showing here in the slide was about in 1880. That's when the Homestake Mining Company comprised of the richest iron formation hosted load claims in the area, covering across both those creeks. Real quickly, what is a syngenetic stratiform iron formation hosted gold deposit? Syngenetic means that it produced at the same time as the enclosing or surrounded rock. Stratabound means that it's only restricted to that certain lithology, that certain formation. And ironically, it's called the Homestake Formation. It's a coming tonight Grunerite iron formation. So at the time uh, in the pre-Cambrian when all this was going on, uh, you had submarine hot springs, uh, probably white smokers coming on up through. That's a picture of it above there. Uh, you have your heat source down below, you have your ocean meteoritic water that's kind of seeping down to the rocks. It's pretty, again, just like we were talking about basic gold mineralization, but it ends up forming these like blobs out onto the sea, these rich mineral blobs that come out onto the sea. And at the same time, the sea uh, is oxidizing. It's, it's the iron that's in the water is actually rusting out of the ocean. So you actually end up getting this iron formation with these blobs. And the iron formation is alternating. It's not solid iron or anything like that, but you know, clear water, muddy water, back and forth. But uh, these little hot springs actually formed where the ore is found today, and they basically kind of look like in the formation, like little cigar cigar shaped ore bodies. Um, and the gold's also uh, stratiform, but the sulfides in that in that uh, uh, ore ore body. There are quartz veins in the uh, uh, homestake formation, which don't have anything to actually do with the mineralogy that's associated here uh, with the gold. But there is chloride along the edge margins of these uh, little quartz veinings, which occurred during the metamorphism uh, later on in the uh, homestake. And along those margins with the chloride there, uh, you get gold precipitating out as well. So you're basically mining the entire strata here. You're not just looking at a vein deposit or anything like that. You're mining out the strata, which makes it pretty nice and rich. Um, the homestake formation definitely went through intense deformation uh, during the, uh, uh, the pre-Cambrian time. 
uh, the quartz veins, like I was saying, was a metamorphic redistribution of the silica. Um, the gold did not. Okay. And then when you go visit this, because when you get to the Black Hills, if you don't go up and see the open cut and lead, uh, you, you're just missing out. But you got to go look at it. But you got to know what you're looking at. If you don't know what you're looking at, you're thinking, oh, there's the vein. There's the big gold vein. No, that's not it at all. It's just like what Mark was saying. This is a tertiary intrusive. And the tertiary intrusives in the northern hills, um, they, uh, they're all over through there. But in the home stake itself, it did not have any bearing on hydrothermal fluid movement. So it had nothing to do for the home stake for ore movement or ore deposition. Um, basically, it, it, it cuts through the home stake formation. And you can kind of see it right here. Here's a cross section. Here's the tertiary vein that they drew going right up through here, or intrusive, I should say. These little lines coming down through here. This is how deformed up that home stake ore body is. It's not just one straight line going down to the center of the earth. It was all crunched and scrunched and as it continues down towards the center of the earth. <laughs> not really, but you know what I mean. Um, but anyways, when you go there and look at the outcrop, just remember that this is not the vein. Everybody's going to think that. The homestake formation is right here. Okay, there's a little bit of homestake formation right here that they didn't mine out. This is garbage rock over here. Ellison formation, I believe. This is garbage rock over here. This is called poor man formation. Really, in this part of the open cut that you can see, the little bit of homestake that they left behind that wasn't feasible to mine right here. This right here, though, intrusive. Just ignore it. Okay, the next load deposit, and this is kind of coincides with the home stake deposit that found just a year after, but they find what's called cement ore or paleoplast or gold deposits. They're also mainly along Blacktail, Bobtail, and Deadwood Gulch. Blacktail Gulch, Deadwood Creek coming down through here, Bobtail Gulch, home stake kind of went through here like this. But these are all these paleoplaster deposits. The first mine uh, was the Reno mine, first cement ore, cement, uh, excuse me, cement ore mine. Discovered in 1876, the ore was super rich, 2.5 ounces per ton. That's awesome. Um, but you got to remember, keep in mind, this is a paleoplaster deposit. So the whole ore body is not. 2.5 ounces per ton. It's along the channel of these paleoplaster deposits, along what you would call uh, the yeah the channel of these deposits. Anyways, um, Chief of the Hills Mine though was also a paleoplaster deposit, and it was the first mine that actually, uh, or it was actually the first ore that was milled in the Black Hills, and it was by use of an arresta. So up until then you'd bang off a bunch of this rock. You'd pound it up with, you know, hand tools and everything. You'd, it's all free milling. You'd take it down to the creek. You'd pan it out. Well, the Chief of the Hills mine was the, actually the first one that actually used the mill was Arresta. And you can look it up. It's, it's just this circular thing. Two horses or mules kind of move around it, pulling a rock, and it crushes the ore up instead of doing it by hand. Um, here's a picture of inside some of these paleoplaster mines. Um, you got to remember that a paleoplaster mine, it occurred millions of years ago. It's not a quaternary deposit like today's plasters are or a tertiary deposit. It's, it's, a, it's occurred a million or more years ago, so it's become a consolidated rock. And in the Black Hills, it's a conglomerate. It's at the base of the Deadwood Formation. Um, so what kind of geological setting was happening a million years ago? Well, Think Oregon coast. You had these estuary type settling settings. You have these Precambrian island arcs, mainly containing the homestake formation or this big island. You have this, all this water hitting up against this island. It basically takes that detrital material that it's, that it's accumulating by all this type of erosion and it starts depositing it in the low areas and the channels that's forming the placers. Okay, that's why the gold ore was so rich. Remember, it's following the channels. It's following the low areas. This conglomerate 
I mean, it ranges in thickness, but you got to find the low areas where the good ore is. However, the tertiary hydrothermal alteration that happened in the Northern Hills did send some mineralized solutions through the lower part of the, of the, uh, the uh, conglomerate here. And those mineral, uh, that mineralized uh, solution deposited out in uh, some rich sulfides such as pyrites and it oxidized out. And being that it oxidized out, it re reduced or took out the free gold or produced the free gold. And so not only were they mining a paleoplaster deposit, they were also mining free gold and oxidized forms through those rich solutions. So these paleoplaster mines were, were pretty awesome, at least initially. And as you can see in the one uh, photo there off to the right of the guy standing next to it, they'd usually leave these big columns of rock to hold it up, or they'd put, use these really big trees uh, that you really don't find too many in the Black Hills today as supports and they would follow that channel the best they could through that hard rock, uh, that hard conglomerate. Okay, so what is the reason then for the richest mile in America? Well, it comes down to the two load deposits we just talked about. Those were the mother load. You had the home stake formation and you had the paleoplaster uh, of the Deadwood formation, the, the basal conglomerate. So, this was exposed at the time. You have your seas crashing up against it. It starts forming your conglomerates on top of all your schist and everything here. And in today's world, what you end up seeing is here's the home stake formation right here. These lines right here are the conglomerates that would have formed uh, right at the turn of the Cambrian. On top here are tertiary intrusives that kind of covered these peaks. Um, so it kind of covered up a lot of this stuff. And then you have today's gulches, Gold Run Gulch, but Bobtail Gulch and Deadwood Gulch and Blacktail Gulch. You can see Paleoplaster is going into these gulches, Paleoplaster and Homestake going down into these gulches. And you have this side, also a Paleoplaster, et cetera, et cetera, as we go down the line. That just, I mean, a double whammy for all those little tributaries and streams makes for a really nice rich creek. Okay, so yeah, we got the richest mile in America, but we got 25,000 miners in the Black Hills and there's not 25,000 claims for them all to get rich. Uh, everybody should know that if you're getting into gold mining, about 95% of you will come home broke. About 5% of you might make your riches, you might, might, you might make a profit and 1% will actually, might actually get their riches, okay? That's basically what it boils down to when it comes to gold mining. But you had all these other miners. The, the, the rich ground is all claimed up and being worked. What do you do? You go look for more deposits. So they start spreading out west and east from the Deadwood and the lead area. And they start claiming anything that had ore value. In 1877, so we're one year after 76 now from those paleoplasters, they discover what's called a replacement deposit. A.J. Smith, first replacement deposit. He stakes the Empire, the Trojan, the Perseverance, and the indispensable load claims. And they're mainly mining what are called verticals and oxidized ore, which is in dolomites of the Deadwood Formation. But major production of these mines didn't really start until 1886 because the ore grade was really low. We're talking 0.1 to maybe 0.4 ounces per ton. We're, look, we're really dealing more with 0.1. It's not too good, but it did end up forming the districts of the Ragged Top, the Portland, the Carbonate, Ruby Basin. Those are some of the major ones. In 1886 though, large cyanide chlorination, chlorination or smelting plants had to be used to extract this gold, okay? Because when we look at a replacement deposit, Basically, you're dealing with these tertiary intrusives. They produce these hydrothermal fluids. They come up through the fractures of the carbonate rocks above it, such as the Deadwood Formation. And when it goes through those fractures and stuff, those are what they're referring to as the verticals. It has the mineralized solution and basically uh, oxidizes out, even though because it's you know it's 
very fine gold, micro gold. We're not talking nuggets here. Uh, oxidizes out, makes it free milling so they can actually crush it and pan it out or amalgamate it. Then they looked at these horizontal layers. So you have this fluid movement coming up through these fractures, but it reaches these porous zones, particular dolomite. Uh, so once it reaches, this fluid reaches these porous zones, it starts to spread out into it. You have replacement again, replacing, dissolving, replacing the dolomite generally with silica pyrite and gold that's in the solution. And um, they looked at two specific layers in the Deadwood formation. There's the, the upper and the lower, okay? The upper was oxidized. They call it the brown ore. So they could actually still get that out by free milling uh, process or free milling techniques. But the bottom layer was refractory and that needed the cyanide or the smelting that needed to be done. Um, so it, it wasn't, it was a lot of hard work. This wasn't easy gold to get to, but where else did they have to go? Like this was the next best thing. So they went for it. Next though, which replacements actually led to these would be the intrusion breccia type of gold deposits. Um, you have these big massive tertiary intrusions, or intrusions, excuse me, uh, throughout the Northern Black Hills. And in the mid 1890s, the first one that finds these intrusive rocks worthy of actually mining was the cutting stock mine. They saw vein ore that represented something that they saw in Cripple Creek, Colorado, and the ore was right around 0.46 ounces per ton. They were pretty excited. So that led to even more claims, looking at all these different types of uh, intrusion breccia type gold deposits, such as the Gilt Edge Mine, the Richmond Hill Mine, the Gladiator Mine, and the Pennsylvania Mine. What are these? It all goes back to that basic concept that we were looking at before. You have this intrusion. It came up, it cools down, it starts forming all these fractures and cracks, but it still produces enough heat below here that the, uh, that the, the water that can, that can come through these rocks will actually start to work its way out of through all these little fractures and everything and start to uh, basically replace deposits again leaving pyrite and gold behind or depositing gold deposits itself and when it gets to the top here it forms a nice little gaussian which is this really oxidized uh, pyrite turns into limonite but it leaves behind exposed wires and masses of visible gold not nuggets okay wires and a residual deposit a residual plaster deposit and when they end up finding that then they realize, hey, there's something on the surface here. Let's start looking below and end up finding these nice intrusive deposits. Which leads to this. In 1904, hopefully you can see this pretty well. This is the claim map of the Northern Black Hills. Deadwood's right here. Leads, leads generally over in here. That gives you an idea of where the two cities are and spreading from the east all the way over to Spearfish Canyon of the west, the whole area is claimed up. Every one of these solid lines in through here, those are all gold mining companies that were trying to make it big. So you probably had about 25, 30 different companies and all these claims, everything that they could possibly think could have gold in it that they were claiming up uh, to thinking they were gonna strike it rich. The whole area is claimed up. And I can guarantee you the whole area does not contain gold, <laughs> uh, but that's just how it works out uh, when you have a gold rush going on. So anyways, let's go on to the next one. So what happens? The whole area is claimed up. All right, well, it's time to move on. Now, the first thing I wanna talk about is plaster mining at Negro Hill, which is now in the Tinton area. This was actually coinciding with what was going on in Deadwood. You had Bear Town, you had Nugget City, you had the town of Welcome. They looked for, they had a lot of plaster gold going on there, really nice, rich plaster gold. They found one or two small quartz vein loads, but it was not the mother load. And it never took off because it's still an enigma to this day. Where is the mother load for all this plaster gold that supposedly was in the area? This is the town of Bear Town, by the way, right? 
So anyways, they were slow to get the news out versus Deadwood. Deadwood actually got back to Cheyenne newspaper and talked about the big rush probably six months before Welcome uh, actually got the news out to Cheyenne. And everybody went to Deadwood and nobody went over to Negro Hill. There wasn't much over there. Matter of fact, the reason it got the name Negro Hill is because the white people in Deadwood kicked out the black people in Deadwood and told them, you, there's nothing here for you. Go, go west, go west, go west. Well, too bad for the white people because they sent them over there. And that's why it gets its name because they found so much gold in what's called Negro Gulch today that they requested, they were the only party that requested and received military escort out of the Black Hills with all their gold. And it wasn't because of the white people trying to steal it from them. It was because of Indian trouble. So uh, that's just a little bit of history on that. I always think that's kind of interesting. Anyways, Northern Hills, we saw it was all claimed up. What happens to the rest of those miners? They start to trickle, trickle back down to the Southern and the Central Black Hills, and they start re-exploring low-grade placer deposits. We all go back to the placer. They knew that there was low grade deposits on those creeks. It wasn't paying. So how are they going to get it out? They start making flumes. They start doing hydro uh, hydraulic ang on these creeks and they start working the upper bench terrace gravels that are easier to get to with these techniques because they know they can't dig down to bedrock. It's too deep in the main creek and they don't have the means to channel the water away from the main creek either. So they go for the bench gravels. And you can see this right along Placerville here on Rapid Creek using big hydraulics, hosing off all the water, uh, hosing off all, excuse me, not hosing off all the water, hosing off all the gravel to expose the, the low pay layer. And then they would shovel that out actually, instead of ground sluicing for some reason, they'd shovel it out and run it through their sluices. Matter of fact, on Castle Creek, they even set up a dredge, one of two, I think, or possibly three that were set up in the Black Hills um, there later on. But this is one of the early dredges on Castle Creek. It only ran for a couple of years. It wasn't very profitable, but they tried. But that plastering though, leads to more load deposits, just like we were talking about before. They started loaming some more. They tried to find out where, well, if there's plaster here, there maybe there's the mother load. Not so much, but it did lead to what we all think of when we think of low deposits, Precambrian quartz veins. They're spread out throughout most of the Black Hills. Some of them had rich pockets. Most of them are low grade deposits. Most produced very little gold. They, matter of fact, they produce such little gold that they only mined the free gold. They just stamp it out and amalgamate it. And they only and they stopped once the oxidation was done. So once they reached the water table around 100 or 200 feet deep, most of these little mines said we're not go, it's not doesn't pay to go any deeper and try to get the refractory stuff out and go through that whole process. There was a couple major producers in the quartz veins though. If you go down to Keystone, town of Keystone right here. If you go this way, you'll head to Mount Rushmore and all the tourist stuff. But if you actually turn left here and go into Old Keystone which is way more historic, turn up the road right here and you'll make it to the Holy Terror Mine. The Holy Terror Mine was uh, a pretty good gold producer in a quartz vein there. 60,000 ounces was recorded. They mined down to 1,200 feet. This mine gave them tons of problems though. They had, they had extreme pumping issues of getting the water out of the mine. They lost people in the mine due to a lot of collapse. It, it was a dangerous mine uh, and not many people really enjoyed working there. The other mine is the Cloverleaf Mine. That's back up near the Northern Hills in the old ghost town of Robay. So if you're heading down Nemo Road and you kind of look off in this direction around the old ghost town of Robay, you might see the remnants of the Cloverleaf Mine, 44 ounces. Interesting story here. Um, I was looking up some pictures for this, trying to find some old pictures of the Cloverleaf Mine and I ran into a Facebook page called the Cloverleaf Mining Company of the Black Hills. And uh, <laughs> I kind of got these people in trouble. Actually, I didn't get these people in trouble. They put themselves on Facebook and got themselves in trouble because 
I was like, holy, holy cow, these people are actually mining gold again at the clover leaf. And it's all, it was all on Facebook. They showed themselves set up with a rock crusher in the back of their truck. They had it going through a trommel and going down a sluice. And then they had the concentrate. It was all super fine dust and they would smelt their concentrate down and they were producing these little gold bars stamped cloverleaf mining company on them. So I was like, wow, that's awesome. Like I've always thought that these little tiny quartz veins could make it as a mom and pop operation. Um, if you could just somehow get through all the stupid red tape and permitting and all that other crap. And um, sure enough, I went right down the hallway here to our mining and minerals guy. And I said, hey, that's cool. I didn't realize the cloverleaf mine was back up and running. And he goes, I've, I've never heard of this mine. What are you talking about? And I was like, you know, the cloverleaf mine in Robe. And he's like, there, there's no there's no mining operation there. And I'm like, it's on Facebook. And he's like, oh, yeah, I guess it is. Well, they were running without a permit. And if you try to look them up, because I got these pictures last week of that little gold bar. Well, today their Facebook page is down. So uh, pretty sure uh, they shouldn't have been doing what they're doing. But uh, you know what? There's a lesson for you. Don't put crap on Facebook. Okay, let's talk about pre-Cambrian quartz veins real quick. In the Black Hills, many are localized along faults and different shear zones in the Black Hills. They're mainly hosted in a schist, which is a meta gray wacky that Mark talked about. To a lesser extent, they're in amphibolites and in uh, and quartz veins can go through iron formations, but we'll talk about that later. The, generally, the quartz vein doesn't cross too much in the iron formations. They can range in thickness from just inches up to 20 feet. Rarely do you find them 100 feet thick. Um, they can be a single vein. They can be a zone of multiple small veins. The mineralization occurred uh, after the development of the schistosity in the pre-Cambrian rocks. So you had all the deformation going on in the pre-Cambrian rocks, excuse me, in those pre-Cambrian rocks. But during regional metamorphism, after that, you have the fluid, you have the heat to get the fluid movement to produce these little quartz veins. So most of the veins occurred before, and some actually occurred after the Harney Peak granite intrusion. Most people think that, oh, Harney Peak must have caused the quartz veining. It didn't. Um, basically, evidence shows that some of the uh, veins were deformed by the granite intrusion. So they had obviously already been here. But there's also evidence that some of the veins cut the granite, in particular in the Ivanhoe district that's now in Custer State Park. So most of the veins pre-Cambrian before Harney Peak granite probably had some veins because of the Harney Peak granite, very few. And you have after the Harney Peak granite, some still heat down there enough to uh, mobilize fluid movement to cut through uh, some of the Harney Peak granite. So the granite was not really the heat mechanism that we we're looking for here in a basic gold mineralization process. It was the regional metamorphism that actually did the fluid movement. Other deposits that were found besides quartz veins were again, more of these iron formation hosted gold deposits. They're very similar to the Homestake formation, but they're just not as rich. Um, they're basically thinly dispersed with sulf and associated with sulfides. Again, they only run about 0.1 ounce per ton. You did have pockets up to four ounces per ton. That would have been awesome. But generally, it was 0.1 ounce per ton. Um, <clears throat> again, these were just like the quartz veins. They were only mining the oxidized zones in these. Once they got down to the water table, they stopped. They discovered these just like with the, church, uh, with the intrusive breccia formations because it left a little gaussin on the top here oxidized pyrite that left behind gold for them to discover as a residual deposit again. And then they'd mine down to 100 feet or they'd mine down to 100 feet, a strata bound deposit. Um, the two main districts, if you wanna say uh, that our iron formation hosted gold deposits would be your Rochford district and the Keystone district too. This is the last type of gold deposit that we have here in the Black Hills, and it's very minor. It's uh, considered a mineralized intrusive dike. 
And basically what you have is you have uh, an igneous dike that would have came up through here, cooled and solidified, but it actually forms uh, a little conduit right here for small veining to occur, small fluid movement to occur. You'd have your rich fluids coming up through the edge here. It's either replacing some things in this igneous dike or actually depositing gold. And it only occurs for sure in one spot in the Black Hills, and that's the Western Star Mine out by Custer. However, this could really be the possible source of the placer gold in the Tinton area because we do have Precambrian granite dikes up in the Tinton area. They're not Harney Peak granite. They occurred at a different time. But if, if uh, uh, this type of deposit was occurring up there, it has been noted in one publication that they have seen thin gold deposits along the hanging wall of these small Precambrian granitic dikes. Has it ever been proven? No. Would it ever be something that gold mines would want to go in and get? Probably not. They're probably very, they're probably scattered all throughout and they're probably very little deposits. And it's probably why most of that area was considered pocket hunting. Okay, let's just briefly look at where most of these locations are in the Black Hills for these other types of gold deposits. Iron formation, talking about right here. Little squares are your, uh, well, it's called a quartz pebble conglomerate. We didn't talk about that. There's only one mine that's a quartz pebble conglomerate and it didn't produce anything, so it's not really viable. Um, the little triangles here are Precambrian quartz veins and the little circles are the iron hosted ones. So little circles all in through here. You can see these iron formations coming down through. This is the Rochford area. Going over to the Keystone area, little triangles, also little circles. So another quartz vein, iron formation area. But quartz veins, quartz veins, quartz veins all coming down through here, quartz veins all over here, quartz veins down through there. Um, here's the clover leaf that we were talking about right on the edge up here. This is the homestake, leading deadwood, right in this general area right here. And over here is the Tinton area. This is where Negro Hill is. And two little quartz veins. Didn't really produce much. Uh, let's just go back really quick on this. Um, Rapid City would be right about here. So when you come into the Black Hills, you're coming right into the center there. Okay, so golden mining, golden age of mining in the Black Hills finally comes to an end. Running into the 1920s, load mining starts to dwindle as it goes into the depression era. Why? Gold prices remain constant at about $20 an ounce, but mining and labor costs increase. As mining and labor costs increase, gold prices remaining constant, just doesn't make sense to keep, keep mining. It, it's, not, it's not profitable. And then on December 7th, 1942, just kind of remember that gap right there, by the way. Uh, that's, we're right into World War II at this point. And, and on that date, all gold mines were ordered to close because they were non-essential metals for World War II. Therefore, the labor force was refocused. All the mining labor force was refocused into mining essential metals for the war, not in the Black Hills so much. And mining equipment was actually repurposed for the war effort. So what happened to the Homestake mine, though? They actually got through it. They used their foundry to actually make hand grenades for World War II and kept a lot of people employed in the Leed and Deadwood area doing so. But after World War II, almost all the load mines in the Black Hills, all those little quartz veins and all those other mines, they didn't reopen. They weren't profitable any, anymore to do so. And the labor force was gone. But there was other gold rushes in the Black Hills. So let's go back before World War II, because there was a gold rush in the 1930s. Okay, dwindling through the 20s, you get to the 30s, what's going on? Great Depression. Well, people go back again to those placer deposits. They dig because they didn't have any work and they're hungry and they needed to eat and survive. 
Here's a little guy running a little dry land dredge right here along French Creek to get down to those deep 20 feet down to bedrock gravels that might actually produce enough gold so that he could eat and his family could eat. I mean, they're just rickety poor man type mining operations. But in 1934, the price of gold went from $20 to $35 an ounce. You got to remember back then it was government controlled pricing. So load mines actually in 1934 got people working again and employed a huge labor force, including those mom and pop operations on those small quartz veins. Main reasons for that was not only just the gold price going up to $35 an ounce, but you also had technological improvements like the combustion engine, bulldozers and dump trucks and things like that actually started making mining easy or easier. Move more dirt, get more gold, make more money. Okay, then World War II and then everything shut down. Well then come 1980s, what happens again? We have another gold rush. We still go back to the poor man's diggings. Yeah, people thought, let's start panning for gold and let's start getting it rich. They didn't, but there was a lot of placer staking of claims and people trying to start up a placer operation here and there. But mainly, excuse me, <clears throat> it was the rejuvenation of the replacement deposit mines and the intrusive breccia load mines. Um, the wharf area, the golden reward, the gilt edge, the Richmond Hill. They all, it came up with a new method called cyanide heat leach method. It opened up super cheap production and with high gold prices in the 1980s, these mines were able to open back up again and start making really good money on it. Now, those gold mines, only one of those gold mines still exists today. There was a lot of buying out. There was a lot of failures. There was a lot of EPA Superfund sites. Well, not a lot, but a couple. Um, so anyways, it, it did open things back up. It did start getting gold being produced again, but it didn't last. It's not still going on today. There's only one. 2008, we recently had a, another mini gold rush here in the Black Hills. And it was mainly staking placer claims and load claims. People are like, oh, yeah, the gold's at $1,900 an ounce. Let's start staking the whole Black Hills out again, and, and we'll find our riches and, or maybe sell them to companies. Uh, it didn't really happen. Uh, it, it was just a lot of staking. However, it did lead to a poor man's diggings, largest undisputed gold nugget in the Black Hills. Notice in quotes, that I put undisputed. It's only 3.96 troy ounces. Okay. It's undisputed because the guy that found it uh, actually had a partner with him. So that, you know, they didn't try to fake this or anything. And they actually took it to the South Dakota School of Mines to make sure that it was truly Black Hills gold and blah, blah, blah. You know, so this is actually an undisputed gold nugget. Well, it's sitting right next to Potato Creek Johnny's eight ounce gold nugget nugget which supposedly is the only, is the largest gold nugget left from the Black Hills, but it's disputed because if you read the stories, okay, some people think it's a fake nugget. It's Potato Creek Johnny, I mean, Potato Creek Johnny lived on hype, okay, like he, it really was, up to his dying day, he was, he got food and drink by telling stories, but like that gold piece, first off, when he found it, when you found a nugget in that town, it was celebrated and everybody, everybody be buying drinks and having fun. Like, yeah, you found a big nugget. The first thing he did was he went back to, to the shop there or to the bar and he said, somebody better get me a gun. And they're all like, why do you need a gun? You've never had needed one. Why do you want one now? And he's like, well, I just found a big nugget. And then they weren't celebrating it. And that's because two days earlier, I can't remember the captain's name, but there was a guy who was on his deathbed, had to be sent down to Spearfish to go to the hospital. And in the process of him leaving, about just over seven ounces of gold was stolen out of his cabin and never found. And they never, they don't know who did it. And two days later, Potato Creek Johnny shows up with a gold nugget weighing 7.96 ounces. Well, I don't know if it's 7.96. It's over, it's under eight. I think it's like 7.9 something. People think that 
Potato Creek Johnny did find nuggets. He definitely had a nugget necklace. You can see it in the Saloon 10 in Deadwood. But they think he took some of his gold, gave it to his uh, blacksmith friend who was notorious for making fake nuggets by shoving a stick into the ground and then pouring gold into that hole. And I don't know if you look at that nugget, sure looks like a stick in the ground that had gold poured into it. But if you want to be the judge of this, again, go to the Adams Museum, check out the Thowen Stone, and go see Potato Creek Johnny's Nugget. It's on display there. You can tell me if it's real or not. But it doesn't matter. Those are the only two nuggets, one undisputed, one disputed of Black Hills gold, but they're not the biggest. The, you All you got to do is go back to the, I think it's the 1938 Placer Minor Journal that the... Uh, Placer Manager on for the Black Hills Engineer, and it'll list all the large gold nuggets that were found in the Black Hills. And the largest gold nugget found in the Black Hills was 21 ounces. And nobody seems to know that, but now you guys do. So when you go there and you talk about Potato Creek Johnny's Nugget, even the guy in the museum thought it was the biggest. And I corrected him. I'm like, no, biggest gold nugget was 21 ounces. So, and there's other bigger nuggets than Potato Creek Johnny's too. So don't believe the hype. That's why I put that on the bottom there. <laughs> Two more slides. Let's talk. We need to briefly talk about the longest running gold mine comes to an end. That's the home stake in 2002. I mean, the home stake is the gem of the Black Hills when it comes to gold mining. It, it was the gem of the United States. It was the gem of North America for the longest time. Closed in 2002. It was the largest and it was the deepest gold mine in North America, 8,000 feet into the ground. Explored down to 9,000 feet. It produced 43. 0.9 million ounces of gold along with 9.8 or yeah 9.8 million ounces of silver during its entire lifetime you can do the math on that if you want to uh, in terms of production it was the second largest gold producer in the united states after the carlin district in nevada and it still holds the record of the longest continually operating gold mine in the united states until it shut down it ran for 125 years. That's unheard of. Reasons for the closure. In 2002, gold was only worth $270 an ounce. Low gold prices. Also, low ore quality and high budget costs. High budget costs probably couldn't be controlled too well, but the low ore quality, a lot of people in that mine think that management goofed up and that they were just bulk mining and that they could have actually high graded. And if they would have high graded, they could have stayed open probably for two more years. And if they would have stayed open for two more years, gold prices went back up where it would have been profitable for this mine to keep running. It is what it is, I guess. Barrick bought the Homestake uh, mine mainly for its other assets throughout the world, but it still owns the mineral rights. Uh, and uh, so Barrick still owns the mineral rights So all the pre-Cambrian rock around there because, uh, and we'll get to that in a little bit, Homestake actually sold off all the mineral rights to the non-Precambrian rock, Paleozoics on up. Um, but going back to 2007, one good thing that did come out of this was the National Science Foundation actually ended up producing uh, or taking the, the Homestake mine. Barrick actually ended up selling it, uh, part of it to them anyways. And now we have a big deep underground science lab there. And I don't know, they do a bunch of physics stuff that I don't understand, but it's all deals with neutrinos. And I guess it's really cool and everything. Um, I, I, I've gone to that museum a bunch of times and it's still over my head, but it's, it's pretty impressive uh, that they're able to do that. And it's all in, done in clean rooms, really deep <laughs> in the mine. I think like a mile deep. Okay, but there is one running gold mine that still exists today in the Black Hills. That's the Wharf Mine. You can actually go see it. It's owned by Courier Mining. That was one of the mines that started in 1983 of the replacement deposit in the Deadwood Formation using heat leaching process. And like I was saying, Homestake sold the mineral rights uh, to Wharf for the Paleozoic rocks only. Barrick still maintains the real mineral rights for the Precambrian rocks. So when they're building this open pit mine, they can't mine down beyond the Precambrian rocks. All they can do is take all that deadwood formation and some in the Pasapa actually, uh, but mainly they're digging the, the deadwood formation and 
getting out that gold. Here's the kicker, average grade of that gold, 0.024 ounces per ton. That's really low grade ore, if you remember right from all the other ones. When I was talking 2.5 ounces, that was awesome. And home stake was like right around 0.3. This is 0.024 ounces per ton. However, since as of 2020, from 1983 to 2020, they've got 2.8 million ounces out of that mine so far. And the reserves that they've calculated show another 1.3 million there. And, and I don't really understand all the different things, proven, probable, measured, indicated, inferred. I'd probably stick with the proven. Uh, the rest, I don't know, you better make it proven for me, but they're counting that all in there to come up with that 1.3 million. What is kind of cool though, is how much does it cost to produce an ounce out of that mine? And these are 2018 numbers because I couldn't get 2020 numbers, but they were exponentially going up about 100 to 150 dollars a year. So in 2018, it cost them 880 dollars to pull one ounce of gold out of the ground. So let's just bump that up to 2020 numbers. Let's just say a thousand dollars. Maybe it cost them a thousand dollars to get one ounce of gold out of the ground. Well, that means every ounce that's coming out of the gold right now, they're making 800 bucks on. And I guess if you're making, you know. 50% profit there, uh, it seems like a pretty good margin. I'd probably take that investment. But anyways, that is the end of uh, Gold in the Black Hills. And I will also entertain any questions that you guys have here. I'll stop sharing too. Oh, we lost participants. <laughs> well, let's see. well we, we lost a few, but most people stuck around. Uh, there was yeah. a lot of uh, looking at the uh, at the questions we have here, um, first one is from I think they're all from Ron Schmidt. He says, "When I was at Mount Rushmore, they talked about how they had to take a lot of rock off the face to get to stable granite before they could make the faces. I don't see them doing the same with the Crazy Horse Monument. Is that going to be a problem for them as well?" Well, um, actually, Crazy Horse has had problems with the rock um, down there. They also have, you know, again, fracturing like they do have at, um, at Mount Rushmore. And if you notice with Crazy Horse, he has his arm out. Well, they wanted a, a big opening under his arm. Well, they're not going to be able to do as big an opening as they wanted to, just because, again, fracturing that rock is not going to be able to support itself. So they have run into similar problems down there but again each site's going to be a little bit different okay very interesting let's see um one here about eight o'clock says can we hear about the mining so i think we can ignore that one okay <laughs> um let's see uh, another one from ron schmidt can you see the kt boundary anywhere in the black hills hmm. If anywhere, it'd be up in Harding County. Um, that's where we have the, um, the um, we do not have that. That would be in, with the Paleocene, the KT. The, uh, so it'd be the Cretaceous Paleocene. We don't have Paleocene sediments up there. So the, the oldest we get for the tertiary up there, well, we do have Paleocene, but I don't think they get quite old enough to be back in that time. I'm not exactly sure though. I have not ever gone up to look for that. Okay. Uh, let's see, another one from Ryan Schmidt. Can you tell us how the needles were formed? Yeah, with the needles, again, that's Harney Peak granite. And I mentioned with the, the schist, it forms these, you know, the foliation, these planes. So when the um, granite was hot, it came up along the schist and forms these, oh, let's say the pen, that's a granite intrusion coming up in the schist. Well, over time, the, the granite's a lot harder than the schist. The schist erodes away, leaving the spire of granite. And so that's how the, um, the cathedral spires were formed. And like the needle's eye right there, that was one of these spires. And there just happened to be a xenolith or a little inclusion of schist in it. And again, being soft over millennium, 
that schist weathered out and it left that, that gap that's in that column, which is the eye of the needle. Okay, very interesting. So it's all due to the rock competency, the granite being um, harder and more resistant than the schist which erodes away. Okay, um, another one is what happened to create Sylvan Lake? That's a dam. And so none, none <laughs> the of the CCC created that. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. So pretty much all the lakes, the larger things in the hills, they're all man-made. The only real natural lakes that we have are the ones in the northern hills. And I mentioned that they're, they're in the sinkholes, Cox, Mirror, and Mud Lakes. There are a few natural, very small, they're essentially ponds in the hills, but all the rest of the lakes in the hills, man-made reservoirs. Very interesting. Okay, uh, here's one from an anonymous attendee. Why is Black Hill Gold rose tinted? Brian? Well, well, Black Hills Gold that you buy in the Black Hills, first off, doesn't come from the Black Hills. Uh, it's made in the Black Hills, uh, which makes it the name Black Hills Gold. And it does, it, it, it has those other colors because it's impure. Uh, it usually has a copper impurity involved with it. Um, which gives it that rose colored look to it. Um, hopefully that answers the question there. I think yeah, they also use a little bit of silver and I think a little bit of, of zinc in there to give different yeah. colors. Oh, well, yep. Silver and zinc too. Okay. Here's another one from an anonymous attendee. How does Black Hills gold mining compare to California Sierra Nevada mining? Well, it depends on what type. Um, I mean, if we're looking at historical, the the Homestake mine outdid every mine. Uh, it produced a ton. I don't know per state how many ounces of gold were produced in California in the Motherlode district versus what has been produced in South Dakota. But my guess is going to be, well, I don't know. I don't even want to guess, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, but but. When you think California, you're thinking mother load and you're thinking like, you know, nuggets galore and everything like that. And that's not the Black Hills. Uh, you know, the Black Hills is generally fine gold, uh, just lots of dust, lots of dust. And let's see, I think this is the last question uh, from Larry Coton. Given the info given earlier about smokers helping to precipitate gold, does that mean it's currently happening at today's undersea smokers? Oh yeah, for sure. Yep. Probably not in mineable quantities and it'd probably be really difficult to get down there, but yeah, processes that happen today mimic processes of the past. And for sure, uh, there's definitely new, there's gold being formed in Yellowstone. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Anytime, anywhere you, you have hydrothermal activity going on deep somewhere, there's going to be gold being formed. Very interesting. Yeah, some, some of the hot springs in New Zealand, Rotokawa, it's the center, the, the carbonate that's forming, like at, at Yellow, or, um, Yellowstone with Mammoth Hot Springs, some of that center, half an ounce to an ounce per ton of gold. And that's precipitating mm. now. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I guess we do have one more here from Ron Schmidt again. I don't mean the water. I mean, the tall rocks and vertical strata at Sylvan, is it the same process as the needles? Yep, oh. same, same yep. thing, yep. Yep, the, the um, granite going up along the foliation in the schist, forming spires and various things that branch out and whatever, then the schist erodes away, leaving these hard, resistant granite spires. Uh, let's see. Well, I thought I saw a thank you briefly, but. Um... Well, guys, this is Steve. Um, we were well over our time limits here. Uh, <laughs> we have to wrap her up for the night. Thank you guys so much. Yes. We covered a lot of territory. Uh, and uh, I know that it was brief in, in that regard, too. I mean, there's an awful lot of geology there. Is there a good, uh, do you have a South Dakota uh roadside geology book is that out someplace yeah there is one 
Um, okay. Yeah, it's um, published by that Mountain Publishing Company, and it's on Roadside Geology of South Dakota. It was done by John Paul Grease, probably 15, maybe 20 years ago. Okay. And it's, again, Mountain Publishing Company. They they produce all those state roadside geology books. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much, guys. Appreciate your your stuff. We'll uh, check in with you guys at some other time too. Sounds good. Thank you Sounds all. Good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night. Thank you. You, you bye too. Bye-bye. Good night, all. Good night.